what you study from this, what you learn from this meeting. Okay. So um, uh, this is our workshop under Spark. Okay. So this is an initiative by Government of India, and it is jointly organized by IIT Madras and IIC Bangalore. And uh, also, apart from it, we also have quite a bit of industry support and sponsors, and including Indie Plus, that's an Indo-Norwegian, um, you know, consortium that uh, is looking at uh, in natural refrigerants. So. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Professor Pradeep Datta, who has been, uh, you know, I am also privileged to be his student for over two and a half, to two decades, I would say. <laughs> okay, so he will probably start the session and then he'll give a brief introduction about this workshop and then we are having a fully packed day, but I think there is enough time that is sandwiched between sessions for you to network. We'll also have a panel discussion in the evening and that will be probably the most important part of this event where we can really find out what the industry needs, you know, and how, you know, transition towards natural represents is going to shape the future of our country and also the world alike, okay? So I'll not take much more time on this. Um, let me just invite Professor Dutta to the stage and he can make the opening remarks. Thank you. No, let it be, let it be. No, let it be. the other one. Yes. The other one, let it be. Yeah. Button, yeah. Yes, then change it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Very good morning to all the delegates here. As Pramod said, this is the right time to visit IISC, not just because of the uh, weather, but also there is a wonderful display of flowers because we. This is the time when we have Foundation Day, you know, beginning of March. Uh, so, so please feel free to go around, you know, when there, whenever there is a break. And huh? yeah, it's okay. No this one, no? No, it's shifting. It is shifting. Uh, so, so, on behalf of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, workshop on natural refrigerants, applications and uh, policies. This is co-hosted by the academic partners, uh, IISC Bangalore, IIT Madras and uh, NTNU Norway, uh, in association with uh, our uh, academic publishing partner Sadhana and also in association with Ishray Bangalore chapter and is also supported by a host of uh, industries, uh, uh, Dan Foss, uh, Alpha Laval, um, and we have uh, Tata Consulting Engineers and many other industries, especially the HVAC industries and end users as well. As we all know, uh, natural refrigerants or use of natural refrigerants is uh, not something new to this world. Uh, working fluids such as you know, water, ammonia or carbon dioxide has been in practice for quite some time as uh, refrigerants. But since the second half of the 20th century, the market has been dominated by the synthetic refrigerants, uh, such as the CFCs, HCFCs, and we all know what has happened. It's the environmental issues, severe environmental issues have happened. But now, fortunately, because of more awareness and um, new regulations, and also um, uh, the awareness of uh, or the objective of sustainability, uh, the natural refrigerants are becoming popular once again. And this has been spearheaded by certain countries, especially in Europe. Uh, they have taken it forward and made it a success story in some countries. And we need to see whether it can be replicated in countries like India or in this part of the world. In fact, that is the central objective of this workshop, to 
create awareness and spread the information about the benefits of natural refrigerants and also you know there are challenges of course technological challenges and how to overcome and so on so so that is the main objective of the workshop and to take it forward this uh, workshop has been organized in association with uh, several agencies and we must acknowledge the pivotal role of all the partnering uh, agencies uh, spark has been a main uh, driver uh, then we must also thank uh, Norwegian Embassy to support this program. They have been supporting this program through the Indi Plus uh, uh, program. Uh, then uh, we have industries such as Danfoss, Alpha Laval, uh, Tata Consulting Engineers, Triveni, uh, Sintef, and uh, many others. Uh, pardon me if I am not naming any specific industry, but we are all here together. So, we must also thank all the uh, HVAC industries you know, to, for their uh, wonderful response and overwhelming support for this program. And also the end user industries who use, uh, who are uh, like building and construction uh, industries as well, uh, real estate industries as well. Uh, because it is at the end of the day, it is the HVAC industries who have to implement uh, such a technology or a new technology into the market. And it is uh, through their effort that one day we will see natural refrigerants becoming the mainstream working fluid in the refrigeration and air conditioning industry. So with that, let me uh, welcome all of you again and let's hope that we, I mean, we am sure that we, we will have a wonderful time interacting with each other. But before we begin, uh, I also have the pleasure in announcing that there is a short video message from uh, our Danfoss India President, uh, Mr. Ravichandran. He could not come here, but he has sent a message through a video, and that we will uh, play it now uh, and then get on with the program. Yeah, thank you again and welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for uh, the inaugural lecture, inaugural uh, speech. In other words, I'll just play this uh, video by Dan first. Morning everybody, uh, welcome to this exciting day, uh, a very important topic and uh, let me compliment uh, Professor Pramod Kumar uh, and his team for putting together a, an exciting program for, for all of you. My personal apologies that I am not able to make it today to this exciting workshop. I have uh, already explained to Professor Pramod, I would have really loved to be here uh, and listen to what's going on in the room. Uh, give you three things. One, this is a very unique partnership that we have signed up with Indian Institute of Science as part of the green strategic partnership between Government of India and Government of Denmark where both the Prime Ministers have committed to a sustainable future. Number two, I think Dr. Pramod Kumar with his passion has really come forward to work together with the industry and this collaboration is to really build India-centric applications using natural refrigerants, both for heating and cooling. And as many of you know, uh, this cannot be done by two companies. It requires a collaborative effort among all of us. As they say, it takes a village to raise a child. Here, building a natural refrigerant ecosystem is as good as a village raising a child. I would like to give you a clarion call all companies present here today, you're welcome on board onto this consortium and we can really make a big difference in building a sustainable India and our technologies and applications from here, we can take you to the rest of the world. Have an exciting day and all the best and enjoy the sessions.
Thank you very much and Jai Hind. So I think that was a good message by the president of Danfoss and uh, he could not really come because Danfoss, Danfoss also is celebrating its 25th year in India and it also coincides with 75 years of independence. So yesterday I was told that when India turns 50, uh, India turns 100, they will turn 50. So that's a big message that was sent out yesterday. But I will not uh, dwell deeper into these things. So we have a full jam-packed day, so I will request Pradeep to um, moderate the session. So we have four talks in the first session, followed by that we'll have lunch, and then immediately after that we'll actually again reassemble out here for another set of four sessions in the afternoon and followed by a panel discussion. So, uh, you know, we are not going to introduce the speakers as such. I think that's an opportunity for you to also get to know the speakers during the networking time. So the first speaker for today is Professor Maya, and uh, he is going to talk about the introduction or about natural residence um, and in the use, right? Yep. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Maya. Thank you. So, good morning to all. So, good morning to all. So, I will not waste time because let him, let him arrange. So, we had nice uh, initial remarks by Professor Pradeep Datta and uh, Ravi Chandran. So, that makes uh, a smooth start for me. Okay, I am here to introduce you know, natural represents, introduction to natural so, my, I've got uh, just 14 slides, so I'll, I'll try to finish in 10, 15, 12 minutes. Okay. My presentation outline is goes out. Uh, okay. My presentation outline, background, refrigerant properties, uh, what it leads to ideal refrigerant, natural refrigerant in characteristics, refrigerant evolu evolution and current scenario, significance of cooling in India, because everyone wants to jump in. Why? Then, finally, conclusions, uh, brief conclusions. Of course, you all of us know the blue taxonomy, and uh, I will not cross the first two at all. So be assured, you don't require to use much of your brain. It will be down only, no problem. Background. What is refrigeration? Methods are means to cool below the surroundings. Natural ice was the only source till recent past. See, our computer is about 60 years old. Ours is twice, or 150 years old. Not, not very distant fast. We are also very quite new. Until then, we the natural ice was used and even India imported ice, you know, imported ice from probably from Norway. We imported ice and used, at that time ice was expensive, it can't be used for, uh, you know, air conditioning. The, the kings and rich people, they shifted the, you know, shifted the capital, we got OT or Simla, and that, that is the fashion. Now, then, you know, refrigeration was invented, you can produce ice or cooling when and where you want. But you have to pay for it because human aspiration is always increasing. You know, energy demand is in start increasing. Then we have got, uh, you know, present day apprehension. So global temperature increase, warming, sea rise increasing. We have got, um, you know, abnormal environmental conditions. You have got more cyclones, whatever it is. So all these things are there. So now we are addressing those things. We have got um, various systems, including uh, vapor compression system is the main know, system where we get cooling and anyway, we have absorption and jet we have refrigerant system that also we use, they anyway use uh, natural refrigerants only. 
the question is only in the case of uh, vapor compression systems. Refrigerant, it is substance or mixture flowing or undergoing thermodynamic uh, processes in an open or closed cycle, transferring heat from lower temperature area zone to higher temperature area. Okay. Selection of suitable refrigerant is a challenge. We can't use anything and everything as a refrigerant. We have to have certain properties, required properties it has to meet. Thermodynamic transfer properties, environmental safety factors, these are the main and of course we have got other sundry points like cost, availability, many factors are also there. They are they dictate to the selection. Important properties, most of us know that normal boiling point, what is normal point, point and uh, critical uh, point, latent heat of vaporization, then specific heat and gamma value, thermal conductivity of, and viscosity, chemical stability and material compatibility, it should not be very stable when it's, when it's left to atmosphere, it should break down as soon as possible. Earlier it is not, not like, it should be stable, stable 100 years, 200 years, not, no more. The electrical properties and miscibility with lubricant and ease of uh, leak detection, toxicity and flammability, cost and availability, ozone depletion and, uh, and global warming. These are the points we look for selection of the refrigerant. Then what are the ideal refrigerant under, as a, as a, a priority? First, no, it, is, it should not have any ODP and UWP. If it is ODP, remove it. Whatever, however it is good. Point number one, first. Then it comes the, the COP. What is COP? Because the COP comes for TV, indirect. So then should give rise to a system that is compact. So we are in comp natural refrigerant, carbon dioxide is in there. Should have non, that is fourth, you know, non flammable and non toxic. We can manage that. Should be compatible with the commonly used materials, then easily and locally available, non, okay, non, non, non monopolized person, but it is there now. So, but uh, nothing is ideal. We have to sacrifice here and there. Natural refrigerant, it has got, uh, you know, it is naturally occurring, it should naturally occur. Some of the natu natural refrigerants are, you can see, ammonia, water, carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons, and you can also use air as a refrigerant. And you can see that life originated after these natural refrigerants formed on this earth. So, obviously, this they can't uh, affect the, the life because we came afterwards. So obviously this will not, uh, whatever we do, it will not affect our uh, environment or global. Characteristics of uh, natural refrigerant, compound to synthetic refrigerant, most natural refrigerants have simple molecule, simple structure, they have got uh, molecular weight is less, obviously that means high latent heat, okay, zero ODP, nil or negligible global warming potential and easy availability, low cost, excellent thermophysical properties and some are flammable, some are flammable and toxic. So these are uh, flammable hydrocarbons, this is uh, little flammable and uh, little toxic and the A1, that is non-toxic, we have got three there, water and air and uh, carbon dioxide. So you can see the first generation, the cooling is the most important, whatever you do, you can use what you can, produce cooling, that, is the, that was the motto then, first generation, we used natural refrigerants including sulfur oxide or whatever possible, then we got the safety factor, then you know HCFC, HFC came in, then we got the problem of global warming, so we got, of, got into uh, you know, HFCs. Then we, we are in the fourth generation. Third generation is uh, uh, ozone depletion. Then we have got global warming, fourth generation global warming, HFOs are introduced. So we can see why you want to go. Every time you see we have gone from here to CFC, one, one jump, then CFC to HFCs, then why not? Why jumping all the time? Why can't we have one jump at least now? H HFCs to you know, natural refrigerant, at least now. 
is it possible? You can see the properties. You see, you got uh, synthetic and natural. You can see it. red cross is not good. Green tick is good. You can you can you know study yourself there. What are these? See, water. We have got. Uh, this is a global warm. Water is a highly global warming gas without which uh, our temperature must have gone down. So in that way, it is required. You know. So that uh, global warming is not an issue. Okay. Now. The pressure of the carbon okay carbon dioxide is also addressed, right? Yeah, carbon dioxide pressure. Actually, we have to consider it as a positive pressure. High pressure means it becomes compact. You no, know? the the gas density will be very high, so the system becomes very compact. So high pressure, and in the olden days, yes, we say that high pressure is dangerous. You no, know? the safety is not very safe. We don't want high pressure. It's no more. we can handle that 120 130 140 bar so that the system becomes very compact and you, you consider as a positive aspect positive aspect i used to always give an example in when i am in village in 30 40, 40 years back nobody touched the gas cylinders so, so because it's very you know dangerous everybody is happy with the firewood now if i go nobody use the firewood everybody is gas cylinder because they are okay with that so same same way after say 10 15 years people Try to use carbon dioxide. No problem. No problem. High pressure. Okay. Now the here you see we have introduced this HFO now, HFO. But it's a, okay. It's a, atmospheric lifetime is very less. It break down. But other we have got other uh, problems with that gas, which is not told uh, public or loud and wide. You know, there are a lot of uh, problem issues with that with that uh, HFO R one two three four YF and ZD. Which is a replacement for R one three four A replacement. It has got some problems, and uh, we need to use uh, the refrigerant, which is good all by all counts. You can see that you see HFCs they are gone now. They are gone. SCFCs are going. R twenty two they are going. Maybe still here and there there, and HFCs are scheduled to go. Should you do at least uh, phase down? Okay. Now we are introducing HFOs in place of. It has to go one day because it is decomposing. It is it is making into TFA. After four, five, six years, people say that no, 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 it's not good. It is making poisonous uh, TFA. It will go to water and things like that. They themselves will realize and then one more change they try to. So what I say want to say is, see, I'm I let us take this Professor Gustav Lundsen has done stated like in 1994. You know, I'm a copycat now. I'm a copycat. I will say, I will say, I'll do this. I just do this. So and 30 years back he told we can we should not replace CFCs by HFC. Now I say should not replace HFC by HFO. That's it. It will if I extrapolate. Significance of cooling in India? We are 1.4 billion at a democratic country, not like a China. No, we have to, we have to follow rules and regulation, everything. No, you have to move with the people. We can't impose. And developing with high aspiration. 78 million people live in slums and tenants, but. They have got air conditioner there, and even even in slums, they have got air conditioners. Okay, shortage of 18.78 million houses has only 20 percent of the buildings that would be in 2030. That means 80 percent of the building will be built in next next to eight years. So so much, you know, uh, business for uh, air conditioning and cooling. We are hot, and uh, of course, cold is also there. Hot country and. Person degree days is a measure of how much cooling is required for a country. No number of people, more cooling, more number of degree days above the set temperature is more, more, more cooling required. So our requirement, cooling requirement, is three times that of China and 15 times that of USA, and equal to rest of the world actually. If you put India in one, and other things both are equal. All rest of the country both are equal. So that much of cooling is required in India. But penetration at present is only six percent 
or air conditioning ref cooling penetration only 6 percent so it will grow and it's growing 20 percent year on year or more than that now some people say their business increased 50 percent so not less than 20 percent so any anybody ventures into a business in air conditioning he'll be successful because he will have handful of work and Lakshman will uh, vouch for me okay uh, any air conditioning people small people will vouch for me you know anybody who goes into air conditioning small business he'll come up Energy use and power generation capacity required for cooling in India would increase 18 to 24 by 2050. At present, at present, our energy used for cooling only is about about 75 terawatt hour, and it will increase to 1,800. Our megawatt, our we got 40 gigawatt power plant for only for cooling. It has to increase to 840. That is about 20 fold increase. Going to increase, it is all estimated by International Energy Agency. Okay, that is why R&D sector, by and large, follows the world. But scenario is changing. We follow, we copy, and we bring in, we produce in China and import it. But scenario is changing thanks to our industry partners, Triveni, and all people are there to, you know, jump into CO2. Their manufacturing scenario is changing. Not that bad as 20 years back ago and has great potential for adapting natural refrigerants. If somebody jumps into this natural refrigerants, there's a lot of scope because the cooling demand is growing. There are a lot of uh, demand uh, for cooling and refrigeration. Uh, cold chain is coming up. So if somebody ventures to natural refrigerant, there will be a good thing because in the 10 years, we may change from HFO to something else. Why, why, why to do that? Why can't go directly to it? We're going to go to go to natural refrigerants. So India adopted safety standards of for natural refrigerants. I think Mr. Simma will tell about policies as he's talked in the afternoon. We have we have some standards adopted in place. Not may not be very comprehensive, but something is there. Improvement in efficiency by various means. We are developing, we are putting it this way, that way, trying to improve the efficiency. And all natural refrigerants are in currently used. Ammonia, evergreen, most of the places we use, I will not require to uh, go into detail, but cascading and low charge units are uh, uh, important. I think Danfoss has given me a list how they are improving the efficiency of the ammonia system. Uh, hydrocarbons, they are used, again low capacity units at present and cascading and low charge is the key. Carbon dioxide, the multi evaporate temperature, simultaneous heating and cooling, sophistication. It needs some sophistication and use that sophistication to improve the efficiency. Water used in absorption systems, um, I think uh, uh, no other uh, absorption system is mainly for uh, air conditioning, it is uh, water lithium bromide system. Then air used in air conditioning and airplanes, and of course in cryogenics also. Then water plus air, we have got empty number of air particulars. This they use both water and air together. So coming to the conclusions, natural refrigerants are there by their own strength at present. There is no lobby to push it at their own strength. Except for V2, the shouting, no, no, carbon dioxide, water, ammonia and all. But, but for that, there is no push for the natural refrigerant. They are competing with synthetic refrigerants against all odds now, because we have to compete with the HFOs now, you know. So, the, but HFOs, there are people to push. There is a lot of money. And finally, they need, they need consideration, support, and intervention to expand their horizon. With this, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your patience uh, patient hearing. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, you know, thank you very much. Nice, uh, you know, informative session, what you have given us. See, with respect to CO2, uh, sorry, you know, I am Suresh Kumar uh, from Carrier Refrigeration Business. I am heading Projects and Service and Southern South India Sales. Uh, this is my profile. So, 
for CO2, uh, in carrier also, we have done more than 20,000 units, you know, in Germany. And it is successfully going on. Some we have done in China also. The skating ring in Olympics, you know, we have done, you know, which is successfully running. But for India kind of a climate, you know, we were also analyzing how does the life cycle cost, you know, how does it stand? That is what we are keen to know yes. since you have done some researches in India. Mm -hmm. So that is what, you know, we wanted to hear from you. Yeah. Of course, definitely there are more competent people than me to answer. But anyway, I can answer also, I will answer. See, we don't say CO2 can be used universally, anywhere and everywhere. The first is low-lying fruits where you need cooling and simultaneous heating at reasonable higher temperature. This is the first thing. Now you put such the umpteen number of applications that. Once we got experience and how to manage and improve the efficiency and then we'll see. I, I don't know whether Professor Harmony will agree with me or not. At, at our climatic conditions, if you say that I'm using CO2 only for cooling air conditioning, only for air conditioning, you know, probably it may not compete with the, uh, with the efficiency, with the cost of the unit, things it may not compete. I don't know. He may, he may correct. I will make a new slide next, next presentation. Yeah. Yes. 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 So definitely CO2 has got its own niche area. Definitely. That's why I don't recommend use CO2 everywhere. I'm not an LAC agent where LAC agent, what will do? Whatever he says, good, 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 good. Bad things he will not tell. I'm not that person. I will tell, okay, you first attempt this. And if you're happy, then we'll see later. Thank you, thank you. Maybe in the other sessions, you know, we'll yeah. discuss more in this. I'll, I'll play the role of LIC agent for Professor Maya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. Can I take the question? Okay. Uh, Professor Maya, my name is Sunil Shah. I'm part of Model Econ. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, for a very good talk. Uh, one quick question, uh, you know, what percentage of refrigeration systems commercially are natural at this moment, CO2 as well as uh, ammonia, globally and as well as in India? Uh, I do not know I, that, I, that way, but okay. CO2, there are many, no many systems in India. Okay. So, ammonia, there are umpteen so, systems, it's right, evergreen, right. you know, all cold storage, you know, yes. if you go to some villages, you can get bumper, bumper that uh, old type. Uh, right, right. Uh, yeah. huh? Bunker, bunker things. Bunker, you know, yes. it's all done. People, the street, they will do just like old people, ambassador car, they repair, right. no? Like that. There ammonia are systems are quite yeah. common, right? So there. there are ammonia systems all there. And right. uh, there is no casualty so far in ammonia systems, no? So ammonia systems are there. People say right. it's uh, flammable and, uh, you know, uh, toxic. But, uh, but uh, we have not heard, not, no, no. Yeah, no things, nothing. Uh, uh, abnormal things there. So, any more questions for Professor Maya? Yes. Morning, sir. First of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for such an insightful talk. Uh, in fact, everything has been compromised into some four or five sites. It was very easy to understand, sir. Uh, sir, I am Commander Anurup. I am posted in INS Shivaji and uh, Indian Navy officer. Probably uh, my question is restricted towards the defense applications. Uh, presently, we all uh, we are operating one transcritical CO2 yes. based uh, plant in INS Shivaji. Thanks to uh, Indian Institute of Science, we have collaborated with them for such a plant. So, uh, my question is, uh, we are trying to marinize it towards uh, application on board warships. So, coming to warships, uh, I have seven to eight years of experience on board a warship. So, first and foremost, what we are looking at, that environmental part is absolutely that is the first thing which we are looking at. Second is with respect to the space constraints. Because as far as warships are concerned, the moment we get more space inside an engine room or in uh, yes. wherever the machinery compartments, we are uh, very much happy. So can you please elaborate on that part uh, if we use a carbon dioxide? Because I know, because I have seen a 30 tr planned uh, in my yes. premises as of now, which is very compact. compact yes. So the moment we go on board, so uh, is it, uh, it's a 30 tr planned as of now. So if we are going to... Uh, make it uh, much more scaling it up to 140 or 150 TR, which is what is a destroyer class of ship which is uh, required. So is it going to actually uh, uh, give a much more advantage on that space constraint part? Yes, yes. Uh, because it is a uh, higher vapor density and all probably uh, you can give some oh, insight into that probably, part. Well, Professor, our next time, Armin answer, yes. Because uh, he's, I got more 
or things he say high pressure means very dense the gas will be like a liquid there anyway Next slide. yes so if there are no more questions let's yes. thank professor okay one just one more question sir uh, good morning professor maya so obviously this was quite insightful uh, the lecture which you have given i have a question not exactly uh, on this uh, technology but in a supporting way since you as well as many other people over here in one way or other way uh, associated with the government so i am representing triveni turbines my name is apurva bose i am uh, looking after the new technology platform there which is responsible to work on co2 technologies so now what we are looking uh, what kind of support from the government side we would be getting going forward because initially the cost of these systems are going to be on a higher side so how we can commercialize it yes. so is there anything which is being worked upon so in um, case you sonal yeah. sonal cw sonal we are we have so got some persons to push in the government also and uh, sonal anything is done yeah uh, uh, i think that is a discussion in the afternoon for a panel point <laughs> Okay, so it, it'll try. If you want an answer, you have to wait till the panel discussion. Yeah. Because we see, it is uh, ultimately if there is any subsidy or if anything is there, the government has to do something. If so, the, so the best questions are reserved for the panel discussion. So please do wait. Okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah. At present, uh, nothing is there. At present, I don't know. At no, present, we, we'll see. I okay. think. we'll run short of time so yes. let's give a round of applause to thank professor thank you Mia. thank you very much thank you i had i forgot to make an important announcement sorry for you know missing it out so in case there is an issue of fire or fire alarm then you're just supposed to run down the stairs and assemble in front of the main building okay so i think i hope that we don't land in a situation but it is a protocol that i need to inform and the restrooms for the ladies are just you know in the in the, near the stairway and the, and for gents it's just outside here okay thank you and if you want to grab a bottle of water there is bottle of water in front thanks so our next speaker is professor hafner from ntnu so we can we can go ahead thank you yes while pradeep is helping me to get it on on the screen my name is s pramod said i mean hafner I'm professor in refrigeration at the Norwegian University of Technology and Science in Trondheim. Uh, I started this position, which is actually the position Gustav Lorentzson had by that time. I started in 2016 after Arne Bredesen when he retired. So you can imagine there are big shoes in the corridor. So I'm uh, I'm trying to to fit into these shoes. This is the wrong one. The other one. No. We take the other one. So, okay. um, In 2016, I started, and before that, in 1996, I started at Sintef. My colleagues are here from Sintef, I'm so we are doing. Go for that. Yeah. I. You have some PPTs. But then we do this. Okay. Uh, I send Very you two PPTs. Oh, I have downloaded only one. Only one. But then we take this one. Okay. okay. We start with this one. Okay. So then we start with the enough presentation first. Enough is a, a new EU project. Can we go for the presenting mode? Yeah. Thank you. I'll download the other one. Also. Yeah. Thank you. So the CO2 presentation comes right afterwards. We can do it right afterwards if you like. No problem. Enough is a EU-funded project. It's a European food chain supply to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 2050. That's a, a target in the so EU. So you put my date and the start. Got it? Can just put my. Oh, more up. Oh, I need to speak louder. Okay. So today I will talk a bit about sustainability within the food sector. That's what we are focusing on, because food—that's what we need. Of course, comfort cooling is also important, but food is even more important. And especially, it's very important. We will come into that. That when we first have harvested something, it should not go wasted. and that's our our mission here also together we can develop systems helping the farmers to preserve the food store it and sell it and earn money so that like your prime minister modi he wants to double the income and we have the the key the key is cooling and preserving the food 
So let's have a look. But there is also something interesting which you can download. It is this sustainability, sustainable development report. It gives a little bit a hint. Are we on track? Are we, are we reaching the goals? And for the second year in a row, the world is no longer making progress. So we are a bit in deep shit, actually. We should do, met, we should do better. And this report gives you some hints in which areas we are good and which areas we should do better. So there, it says, uh, for example, all the different, you know, the sustainability goals, all the different what? For each of them, it looks into each country, and you see even Norway is red. So not everything is good in Norway. So we need to do also more, more progress. And it has also, if it's green, it's fine. Then you achieve the goals. If it's yellow, it's still uh, challenges are remaining. And if it's red, major challenges <coughs> remain. So we have, we have to do something. And you see, on, on climate action, you are ahead of us. In the green, we have a challenge. So there is something to work on. So, and it, all the different things. Life on uh, water, uh, fisheries, and so on. There we have done a a good job, we are still not, not green, so we have to focus. And this report gives us the hint where to look into. What, what should we focus on? That's good. Yeah, there needs to, it's probably related to fisheries, how we, we, we handle the fisheries, how we, we, we treat uh, the water and all this stuff. So, but going to the report, it shows you the, it gives you the direct uh, kind of tasks to, to be followed. And all these here are related to the f value chain for the food, food value chain. So that's where we, we focus in this project on. And uh, one third of the total global warming, global greenhouse gas emission, are related to the food system. So it's, it's a lot. And you see, farm gate is one, about one third of it. Post farm is another third, and land use and so on. That's the, that's the other one. So, but this is this is where we can do better and we can do a progress. That's where we where we should focus on, and uh, especially post farm. That's when we come into the sector. And you see, the emissions in Europe on the cold chain are divided like this. They some on the process, of course, huge on transport. Imagine a lot of uh, food is produced in the southern part of Europe and then brought all the way across, mainly by truck. That's why we have this fuel diesel is a big issue. Next is storage and retail in the shops. And there you see where our friends from Carrier do a great job because when we transfer all the retail shops to natural working fluids, we can shrink this one. That's what we are doing together. And the domestic, that's when, when the food is already in your home. There we don't have much less, much of these old refrigerants left. Most of it is converted to isobutane anyhow. So let's focus on the food supply. And then the equipment itself has a lot of this. And the food waste. We, we need to teach the children and ourselves if it says three for two, do we really need three stuff when we go to the shop? Are we able to eat it? Or will it be wasted afterwards? That's very important to understand. Eat what you buy. Don't throw it away. That's the first thing I think we can learn. And 7% of the food produced is lost due to the lack of revitration. So that's also, that's when it post farm on the farm, <clears throat> towards the shop. That's where we can help. And 20% uh, of the food which is then produced is also waste, and that's far too much. And remember, maybe the slide is coming, but when it is already in the shop, it has, it's not only the growing, it's the fertilizer, it's the transport, everything is already included. That is already on the bill. So that's why it's so, so much more Impl uh, important. So, what is the food value chain? Of course, it's the production on land or in the ocean. 
and then it goes in the food value chain. When we harvest it, when we process it, slaughtering, washing, filleting, cooling, freezing, drying, that's where we come in, where we need to do it energy efficient, but also not destroying the environment with these products. And the processing, we need to reduce the energy demand. As we, as we looked into, we need to utilize surplus heat. Many plants, they have chilling, freezing. Everything goes to the crow. And on the other side, they're boiling uh, fossil fuel to make some hot water. That's completely stupid, but that's life. And that will change. We need to change. Otherwise, we will not reach the targets. And, and this is pointed out there. And we need to plan and optimize the equipment and the packaging to reduce the food loss. And like we do in the commercial refrigeration sector, we need to switch to natural fluids, even in the production. Many of the production facilities have ammonia as a refrigerant. Yeah, no problem. So don't go away from ammonia. Make it rather more safe, the systems, if there is a concern on that. Rather focus on, on that part. And, uh, Yes. So percent or total emission wise, these two are small, but it's anyhow, everything counts. We need to do it. So and 60% is refrigerated, especially in Europe. But here also, I guess, more and more food is convenient. It's more, more, is, more is processed and cooled. And it ne needs energy. When it's transported, that's a challenge. I mean, that is, in Europe, our big challenge. Here, we have a solution, but here we, the transport needs to change. That is on, ongoing. I mean, other fuel types are coming, kind of uh, transportation. Or it's also, we are transporting a lot of ice. Uh, typically, when fish is transported the old way, a lot of ice is in the box. So that one third of the trucks could be avoided if we remove the ice, for example. So there is a big potential. Fish and meat, the beef is the bad. All, and that is no, no surprise. And uh, that's why we need to look at this. So vegetarian is also good, not meat all, all day, every week. And the value chain, the storage, controlled atmosphere, and also, this is something also for India. I mean, if you have 40% loss of food in the, on the farm, with this kind of technology, we can really store the products much longer, also into periods where the farmers or the community can get much more value for the product than if everybody has mangoes, the price is low. But if you can sell the mango three months later or four months later to the same quality, it's much better. Of course, it has a price to, to get there, but, but I think the revenue is much higher. But on the other hand, we don't need the strawberries in the very off-season. It's another thing, a habit which has introduced, in, at least in our part of the world, people are expecting all fruits all year, every time. That's also not possible. And they see it now in, in England, in, in Great Britain, there's a shortage on tomato and uh, cucumber and all this stuff. Because there is, it was too cold in the southern part of Europe and the supply chain is not uh, work. There is no production, the production is less. So now they have to see, they see even empty supermarkets in that part of the supermarket. So, but it will change. We, we, we need to think seasonal products and, and uh, not always, all, all year round. And it also, the retail and commercial kitchens, they, they are looking into reducing food waste and also energy efficiency. And by, by switching to natural working fluids, as I said, we can really avoid the upper part. We go natural. And uh, the consumer, that's us. We'll, uh, so if you, if you point on somebody, there are three fingers pointing to you. Uh, so first look on in your, into your own fridge. But that's, that's OK. That we, we can do that. It will come with the kids and the policies. And 
not so many people want to save energy, but money. So if, if this has a, an efficient uh, kind of cost advantage, everybody will do. Food loss is really important to understand. It's because, as I said before, when, when we have the production, OK, it's a sum, some uh, emission. But the further down we come, the, the closer we come to your fridge or the food when you have it at home, the more it has been added. So it's much more potent. So we need to be aware of this. So eat what you buy. So we are looking in this project through all the different parts. We have uh, many partners, over 40 partners across Europe, to bring this together to, to demonstrate how it can be done so others can adopt it and do similar in the cold chain. And if you can keep the product quality high, then it stays longer than it is eaten at the end of the day, which is our goal. So these are all the partners in this project all across Europe. And uh, I think we are on a good way to showcase all the different fields. We have a lot of demonstration sites from supermarkets, high temperature heat pumps, cold freezing facilities, and showcase them and, and disseminate all these results. So you can go on, this, uh, on the website. Here you see where all the partners are from. And uh, Christina is the project leader. And there is a website, and you, you're free to download everything you found there. And also, if you have a question or challenges, just ask. They will help you. Even, even outside Europe, we will, we will help. Yes, so that's for this one. Thanks. If you have any question, please. I will try to answer. Otherwise, I bring the question to the project leader. Thank you for this part. Thanks. Any question? Yeah. Yeah. Is it already on on stage or? We'll do it after. Yeah. After you. Okay. Ah, no problem. I can do it now. No problem. Yeah. So, but then we we go ahead with you, and then I come back. Let's do that. Can somebody make a picture with this logo? Because I need uh, this to prove. <laughs> Maybe you can switch off the light once more, because then it comes back. So otherwise, ah, is it? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, fall in, on stage, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Enough is enough. Okay. Thank you. You get this one. Okay. Then I mute. You extended it. You went in the extend mode, I think. Just now it was there. I didn't do anything. So once again, good morning to all of you. Light, and uh, so this is uh, my talk is going to be a little bit brief, but it's just our experience on 
um, you know, building natural refrigeration systems and particularly carbon dioxide. So we'll also do one on maybe propane in the near future, maybe this year we'll actually do a system on propane, a full large system on propane. So maybe the next session we'll have something to discuss on propane on this. So it's just in the context that many a times the industries feel that they're quite ahead of the academia, but I think there is, uh, this slide uh, sh will certainly show you that, well, academia cannot be just completely ignored. We still have a role to play in this transition. Thank you. So if you look at, if you look at this uh, protocol, the, uh, we, are, we are a signatory to the Kigali protocol and we are also have pledged that by 2030 we will reduce the, uh, yeah, by 2030 we'll actually be moving or transiting towards uh, the use of adoption of natural refrigerants. But many a times what we have noticed is that we just wake up in the nick of time and say that, well, now let's hunt for technology and then try to adopt natural refrigerants. So I think it's the right time right now for us to begin this journey towards moving towards natural refrigerants. So it's, so my urge to all the industry, in, industry participants is that let's start, let's start moving ahead right now so that we are in the game and then we don't scout for technologies abroad and then say and adapt it to India. So we are hoping that with the, you know, by 2030, we should set an example, and then the red spots, what Professor Hafner mentioned, that we should also turn them into green in, for our country. So, just, just to tell you about, you know, many a times, even despite actually we showing multiple times that what is a transcritical system and how different it is from a subcritical system. So we have done this, uh, this you see on a pH diagram, this shows a subcritical system that typically for R134A and then it is on the same diagram, you have a transcritical CO2 system that is posed uh, out here. The green one shows the pH diagram for carbon dioxide and then the orange one is for R134A or most of your synthetic refrigerants. So if you see here, you know, why the term transcritical is that you are now op operating above this critical point so you have single phase heat transfer that takes place in the gas cooler or the, uh, and there is no condensation that is taking place. Whereas in the subcritical system, you have a phase change that takes place on both on the evaporator side as well as on the condenser side. So this also gives you a nice information about what are the kind of pressures that we're looking at. Typically, most subcritical systems, you know, maximum if you look at only R32, probably it'll go to about 35 bar, but rest everything else is just about 16 bar or 18 bar is the uh, high, high side pressure in most of the subcritical systems. Whereas the, that is probably even much higher than the, much, that, that is much lower than for a comparable CO2 system which will operate for an air conditioning system is about 40 bar. So about 5 degrees Celsius, you have the saturation pressure corresponding to 5 degrees Celsius is close to about 40 bar. So what it means is that now we are moving to a high pressure system. So everything that we have learned and whatever we know about subcritical systems, most likely if you want to carry the same knowledge, then it's going to be very difficult for us to migrate to um, a transcritical system. So this needs a different kind of mindset, a different kind of manufacturing technology for us to move ahead to um, you know, transcritical systems. Another thing that if you see here, you know, this is on an exact scale. If you see the latent heat here, for a subcritical system, R134A is quite high, you know, compared to, uh, compared to CO2. So how this is compensated for an idea, a similar capacity system is that now you have higher mass flow rates. So there's another misconception that higher mass flow rates means bigger equipment sizes, but that's not the case. In fact, for carbon dioxide, you'll be surprised that the operators are much smaller and even the gas coolers are much smaller compared to what you would anticipate for a 134A system. So this is, this is a typical application for, uh, for cooling. So we we'll, we'll look at, and this is what happens inside the evaporator. So if you look at evaporator, it's about 2.5 bar compared to about 40 bar that you would need for a, a similar capacity uh, CO2 system. This is for air conditioning with five degrees as the uh, set point temperature in the evaporator. Now let's look at heating. And this is where the differences really come out. If you look at, particularly 134A system, you are now limited on both ends. You are limited by the critical point and then the critical pressure of, of uh, 134A which is close to about, I think it's about 36 bar or near about 40 bar. 
but then whereas for carbon dioxide you are anyways for even cooling you are much higher than the critical pressure of about 73.8 bar. So in that case what happens is now carbon dioxide probably can actually do cooling as well as heating. Whereas if you want to do with a 134A system, now you have this limitation here on the evaporator side that you are going to hit the isotherm that is closer to the ambient and that will limit us in even having any compressor operating at a much higher pressure ratio. So you have a knee, knee point out here as well and then a knee point here that is limited by the phase change that takes place in the condenser. So when you are actually selling a transcritical CO2 system, the way to really market is that you should say well heating is a priority, cooling comes free. So if you say that well cooling is going to be my criteria for COP measurement then we are actually catching it on the wrong foot. You should say that heating is the primary intent and cooling is free. And if you want to do that then with 134A you probably would need two systems. And this is where it completely distinguishes and is a game changing thing there. Now you have a single equipment and the single equipment could do both cooling and heating. It can produce hot water and it can also do air conditioning for you. So now of course transcritical systems are difficult to understand, difficult to build, okay. But fortunately there is a lot of work and the industry is quite, you know, mature in terms of the controls. So if you look at this particular slide, so depending on the ambient condition, the controller, most of these controllers, you know, this is one particularly from the Danfoss thing there, it will adjust the high side pressure to ensure that now you can operate at the maximum maximum, uh, you know, COP point. So this particular thing is actually programmed into your controller. So you really don't have to worry about it on how, how you're going to optimize a transcritical CO2 system. So if there is an application, I'm sure that somebody from the industry who sells these controllers will come and help you out in selecting the right kind of controller for you. So this, this controller would do even seamless transition. Let's say for example, if your ambient temperature comes down below 31 degrees Celsius, then this can seamlessly transit even into the subcritical mode. Okay. Yeah. So why do you think that, you know, there is a lot of academic learning is that as you see the single phase heat transfer in a transcritical CO2 system gives you that additional flexibility to independently control both temperature and pressure which is not possible in a subcritical system. So with this it gives you tremendous opportunities with a single system you can have multiple evaporators and all operating in a single gas cooler. So essentially you can have one compressor and you have three stage cooling which is ideally very difficult to do with any subcritical system. So that means that sizing of the heat exchanger, selection of components, system design becomes a very important task and that's where the academia can certainly help and bridge this gap. I'm sure that in the near future the industry will still go ahead of us and there will always be a catching game for us to do. But right now I'm sure that all of us can contribute to the successful development of the transcritical systems and migration particularly in India for us because see unlike the European countries where most of that time you operate in the subcritical regime, we are being a tropical climate, you know, we have to operate and most of the time we have to operate in the transcritical regime. So this is where we can really, uh, you know, uh, help you achieve what you would need and customize the solutions for you. So a key feature about a CO2 system is that everything revolves around these three heat exchangers. So, what we have seen is most, of, most often that since you have single phase heat transfer that takes place, it, since you are operating above the critical point, the selection of the heat exchanger becomes a very, very important criteria in defining the success of, uh, you know, the t uh, or transcritical CO2 system. So I will also show you another slide in which how the properties of carbon dioxide actually play a critical role in, you know, uh, in getting the efficiency numbers or COP numbers that you would actually pitch in against 134A. So if you keep reducing this pinch, you look at this curve here, it's nearly flat. So you have nearly, you know, constant temperature or a small delta T, you can add a large amount of heat, the water heating, particularly for this, it doesn't shoot up like this for a 134A system where your pinch becomes quite large on the, on the approach end. So this is, this is from another study. So just to give an idea about pinch, what really needs limits heat transfer is, this is single phase heat transfer that takes place with uh, carbon dioxide 
okay? So if you have water or if you have any other fluid, so what is really going to limit the amount of heat transfer that can take place is if you have particularly if you have phase change, so this is the minimum delta T that is needed for heat transfer to take place. So essentially that what it means is that your pinch point is a key control point in your, that defines the efficiency of your entire system. Now coming to this, you know, so ideally this is what as Professor Maya mentioned that kinematic viscosity, density and thermal conductivity are critical, critical parameters that define the performance of a heat exchanger. So ideally, you know, as an academician you would like to be in this regime here, but for us as a, for an industry person you would like to be away from all these anomalies or where there is typically a large amount of phase change that takes place. But unfortunately, this is what we have been doing for supercritical Brayton power cycles. But when you're looking at, when you're faced with transcritical CO2 refrigeration systems, you're bound to operate in this region here. So suddenly, you'll find that the heat transfer area needed becomes significantly large. If you just have a small, small, uh, you know, movement from say 40 degrees, you move to 38, then number of plates in a plate heat exchanger actually significantly increase. I'm sure that Pratik would actually be talking about it. And another part is, uh, a very important aspect of carbon dioxide is that it's kinematic viscosity. Kinematic viscosity tells you, it sort of gives you an indication to the resistance to flow. It is one order lower than that of air or water. So that means that you can now push carbon dioxide in very small cavities, very small tube sizes without having to worry about pressure drop. Okay, so this is a very big advantage with carbon dioxide that probably is not talked about when it comes to the advantage of using carbon dioxide. Okay, so th this is again, you know, this is not that it's a, it's a cooked up slide or anything. This, we did some sizing thanks to Vinod, my student actually, he, I told him, you know, find out for a 100 kilowatt system that what would be the typical size for a 134A and compare it with maybe a R744, this is carbon dioxide. So if you look at it, these dimensions the, are exactly identical. So it tells you that you know, 191 by um, 697 is basically the height and then this is the width of the heat exchanger. But look at the depth, the number of plates that define, you know, this is just 191.7 mm is essentially the number of plate that, that are needed for carbon dioxide for a 100 kilowatt uh, evaporator compared to 465 millimeters of what you would need for a R134A system. So there is a significant amount of size reduction and this is something that you know, is ideal for cases where you have compact spaces like ships or any other thing there. But nevertheless, you know, space is a premium. And specifically when you consider that you're going to use this for hot water production as well as for cooling, then this becomes an important criteria. You can put it on a rooftop and you can still save a lot of space. So we are certainly going orders of magnitude lower. And the thing is that equipment manufacturers are trying to shrink this size even further. Now we are seeing uh, this gas coolers with 6 millimeter uh, internal diameters. Okay. I'm sure that you know we have friends from Thermofin. So Thermofin now is using stainless steel uh, uh, heat exchangers, They're basically gas coolers which are air cooled gas coolers with 6 millimeters in diameter. That is the internal tube size. Okay. So another thing. See, all the while, people only talk about the pressure ratios. True, pressure ratio for 134A and R744 carbon dioxide will be identical. But what is really forgotten is the threshold pressures. So if you look at carbon dioxide, it's 110 bar, okay, compared to maybe what you would get with 134A would be about maximum about 16 bar. So if your f fluid has to flow, then it, it flows only because of virtue of pressure difference. It's not the pressure ratio that defines the quantum of fluid that actually flows in. So the driving, the motive, the motive energy for the fluid comes because of the change in the, the differential pressure. In that sense, carbon dioxide, even if you have an ill-sized heat exchanger, if you have basically a higher pressure drop, it will certainly allow the fluid to take, the flow to take place, which is not the case with 134A. So essentially what it means is that you have much more potential for the fluid to flow through when you use carbon dioxide systems. And this also means that it is relatively insensitive to a large changes in the ambient conditions compared to what you would have with normally a uh, subcritical system. So this is, uh, you know, this is what we did, you know, I think with permission from Indian Navy and other things. So this is a system that is being deployed at Indian Navy. It was jointly developed by um, 
Danfoss, Fiveni, Modulicon, and IAC. So this has been working for about maybe 1600 hours right now. Six eighty hours out there. Okay, so you can certainly get some more information from the Navy folks. So, and this is another thing that where we're trying to see if we can even reduce it and make it even much more compact. Okay. So the learnings from this is, you know, we had our own share of issues with this. So if you look at poor quality wells, then typically you have clogging in the ejectors. This is a big problem with carbon dioxide. All of this will eventually get collected in the heat exchanger. So that means that heat exchanger plates can, there's a potential for heat exchanger plates to be punctured. So what you really need is a very clean system. And uh, thanks to Danfoss that, you know, we got quite a bit of information from, uh, from Danfoss on what are the typical failures. And these are typically because we have not uh, done a good job in, in essentially building the system. So if you look at even ball valves, all of this dirt and you have higher velocities, you have higher pipeline velocities. So higher pipeline velocities means that this is become, this, any dirt or ingress inside the system will act like a projectile which can potentially puncture the heat exchangers. Okay, so I have a couple of videos. So there's another thing, so this is again taken from our lab only. This is something called a explosive decomposition. So what it means is carbon dioxide is a notorious fluid. Okay, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be tamed. But what it really tells you is that it's actually used for coffee extraction. It, it is a very good solvent. So essentially it will dissolve almost virtually any polymer. So this was, we were having tremendous issues on, you know, finding out where we are, where to arrest the leakages. And this is a gasket that goes and sits inside the oil separator out here. So I'll show you a video out here. So what we did was, every time we'll remove this and we know that there is a leakage out here. You know, we remove it and then we never take a photograph, we find that the o-ring is fine. So, and this was something that was a hide and seek game for us. So what we told, what I told one of my project staff is that immediately take this gasket out and take, send me a photograph. So you see the blisters on these rings, the, on this o-ring. If you, if you, if you take a photograph maybe 10 seconds later, then this will look like a normal o-ring. But if you just understand and see what is there inside, you'll have micro cracks. And these micro cracks are really the pain points for the leakage out here. So I'll show you a video out here. You see the leakage here. You see a small amount of bubbles. And it was extremely difficult for us to identify this leakage. Because we replace, every time we replace an o-ring, then we realize, well, this is where we're not able to arrest this leakage. So another thing, you know, Carbon dioxide can be pretty notorious. It can leak from virtually any place because it's got very low kinematic viscosity. So if you look at another one here. It might have some classified information, so I have to mute it. So if you see here, you see the leakages out here. And these are these were actually measured on a surface plate. You can you cannot even put a shim inside, but then it just starts leaking. And these leakages are extremely difficult to find out or arrest. So there's another one here, and you know a wrong selection of component or a switch. These are these are unimaginable places that you will find a leakage. This is leaking from a terminal block of a pressure transducer. This is the last thing that you would actually expect that something would actually leak from a terminal block of a projector, this uh, pressure switch. But, you know, yeah. Okay. So what are the things that you would need? Professor Maya emphasized the need for you know, safety to be exercised in CO2 systems. But I think if you want to get CO2 systems right, then there are certain investments that one would certainly need to do. And we would, st based on our experience, we would strongly recommend that you should do 100% orbital welding. So this can be done without, you know, you can just have the pipelines that are inserted and then you get a nice clean weld. You don't have any ingress of any of the dirt inside. So it certainly avoids and keeps the system pretty clean. Then 
Also, you need a good leak detector. Now, we are going to have a very good leak detection system which we are, you know, using it for our dry gas seal that is for the turbo machinery and this can detect very fine leaks including a person breathing, it will detect, you know, the carbon dioxide that is being uh, leaked out. So, you certainly need this protective gloves and other things there because these are projectiles. So, you have to understand the differential pressure is pretty high. So, anything that flies off the system and if you are standing next to it without any personal protective care, it is a projectile that is going to shoot at you. So, please be very careful when you use handle particularly carbon dioxide systems. We are a little bit negligent in terms of safety. This is something that we should really avoid. And you also need a gas booster system and a gas booster system is because you are going to use commercial carbon dioxide cylinders. So, commercial carbon dioxide cylinders come only up to about 60 bar. So, if you want to really drain that completely drain out the cylinder, then you have to have a gas boosting system which will allow the carbon dioxide to go up to about four, about 6.5 or 7 bar up to the, um, you know, liquid temperature at about five, uh, about up to about 5.5 bar. So, these are things that, you know, because you are coming from the industry, these are things that certainly you would need, but I'm, I, I, we can certainly tell you that if you have all these things in place over investment over time, then you can certainly build trouble free CO2 systems. This one? Yeah, this one is the next one. This is a, so this is a camera that we will probably get another week. Okay. Okay, so you can just take one snapshot. I will tell you all the leaking points for carbon dioxide. Okay. It can tell you, you know, the points that where we had in terms of even the leakages across switches. Those things also can be arrested. So you, it, it saves an enormous amount of time in terms of what, on, uh, in terms of identifying leaks. This is a, uh, NDIR system, so non-dispersive infrared laser system, but this is again very tedious. So, for leak detection for the system that we built for the Navy took us nearly a month. Okay. So, it is precious time. So, I am certain that you know this is going to help us arrest it in a couple of hours. Well, you have tailored gases as well. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and this is my last slide. So, people who say that CO2 is toxic and it is uh, harmful, actually it's not the case. We have been living with CO2. If you go outside and breathe the air, you know, in any of the cities during the evening traffic, it's much more harmful than actually, you know, having standing next to a CO2 cylinder. So, it's uh, certainly not harmful. But of course, it does not mean that you can afford to leak CO2 out, you know. These are the different levels. So, 370 is what is there in the atmosphere. <laughs> well, I'll make changes to the slide. I need to update it every year. Well, this is a, maybe in this room. <laughs> okay, so so essentially, we we can tolerate up to about 5,000 ppm. But you know, and if you have 5,000 ppm leaking in your system, that means that there is a microscopic leak in your system, okay. So, there is, it is not going to be any harmful, I mean it will not cause like carbon monoxide and instant death or a slow death, but then CO2 is again, we would not say that high levels of CO2 is not good for us because we are not designed to breathe air with a large amount of CO2. So, another thing is, see the CO2 will, the systems are, you know, there was a question about the rise in cost of a CO2 system. So, I do not think we are doing a fair comparison between CO2 systems and conventional 134A or because CO2 comes under the industrial category. These are much more robust. These are much heavier systems. They will last 30 years at least compared to 4-5 years of a conventional commercial 134A or any of the system. So, I think the comparison is not fair. So, if you invest in a CO2 system, you can be assured that it is going to pay you off for 30 more years. Right, so I don't have any any other um, slide. You know, I hope I made it in ten minutes. But um, in the interest of time, probably any questions? One question. Yes. Lower kinematic viscosity. Uh, lower kinematic viscosity from a technical point of view is advantageous because you can shrink the pipeline diameters, but then from a system point of view, it's leakage point of view, it's a pain. So, if, 
we have it, it's a nightmare to arrest CO2 leaks. So we we recommend all welded construction, but unfortunately many components will certainly need you know with an O-ring and other things there. Okay. Yeah, I am Venkana from Train Technologies. Uh, if you see the current uh, situation because of the gas supplies issues uh, and also sustainability, the 60 to 70 percent of the heating systems in North America or Europe, not like in India. So the gas systems are getting phased out. Mm -hmm. So that's a good news for uh, refrigeration and air conditioning industry that heat pumps are going to be replacing. And in fact, um, I heard that in uh, North America, they are giving, using heat pumps, uh, certain subsidies. So, but uh, we have certain challenges on heat pumps, uh, will not work at minus 20 degrees C. And there are some developments are happening. And coming to the interesting topic, the insights which you showed, thanks for that. And what is the efficiencies uh, between uh, the new reference we are talking about 545B uh, uh, and other reference which are going to replace 134A or R410. Um, the interesting topic what you showed that COTs are good for heating, heat pumps, right? So what are the efficiencies? Any study has been done with the new reference which are coming with the 250 uh, less GWP reference. So uh, we would like to take this question maybe in the second half if it's fine or Professor Hafner can take. So one, one thing is certainly CO2 is not bad and I think you should talk to the folks from the Indian Navy who have been actually using the system. So it all depends on what is the differential temperature pinch that you achieve and CO2 you can achieve as low as about 0.5 degrees Celsius which is unimaginable with 134A or any other synthetic refrigerant. If you do that then your efficiencies are very close to convention systems and you get, you get cooling free, you know, the co entire cooling is free, okay. So if you want slightly, if you are a little pessimistic, take heating free then use the cooling but you can certainly get very close efficiencies. Maybe just, maybe just a comment. I mean, if you have a, if you have the minus 25 as your ambient condition, even with the CO2 system, you have a, maybe 10 of 10 bars still on the suction side. And, but it depends very much. What do you want for heating? Is it floor heating at 30 degrees C, or do you produce hot water at the same time? But there are system designs for this kind of heat pumps. And I will show you in the next presentation that the fluids you have mentioned, they will not come. I will show you why. Okay. So, so another thing I think we all forget, you know, is what about the greenhouse emissions due to the production of the synthetic refrigerant storage, transportation use? You can now, you can buy a commercial uh, CO2 cylinder that is used for welding and you can top up your refrigeration system. We have not seen any issues with it. As long as your moisture content is less than about 30 ppm, which is anyway a requirement for welding gas. So this is perfectly fine. Mm. So you look at the greenhouse emissions associated with production of these refrigerants that nobody talks about. So it's a very skewed scale in terms of what we are portraying CO2 as, you know, uh, as a refrigerant. But even in these heat pumps you are talking about, you will see that R290 is the fluid to use. Nothing five something. R290 is the, the, the market is requesting for this kind of heat pumps. Even if you look at the split air conditioner you have in, in, in India, the Godrich units are using 290 and they're more energy efficient than what you have else in the market. Even for this low temperature heat pump, you will see R290. Good morning, yeah. uh, yes. uh, Sri Pramod, sir. Uh, I am Bhaskar. You can call me Pramod. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Uh, I am Bhaskar, I am area sales manager for uh, Baltimore Air Cal Company, BAC. Okay. We basically into energy refrigerants. Uh, most of our installations in seafood uh, for uh, ammonia, uh, basically. We are already promoting uh, ammonia in uh, low temperature applications. So my question is, uh, you have discussed about transcritical, subscritical and uh, three refrigerants like R134A carbon dioxide and R717. So, 
condenser for that matter uh, in CO2. So what is the operating pressure you are expecting uh, if there is a condenser to be pro produced for carbon dioxide? Uh, what is the operating pressure for condenser and what is the test pressure for the coil of condenser? So I, I think this question, uh, it's not appropriate for me to answer but we will have Pratik, you know when he talks about the alpha level heat exchangers. But subcritical, just to give you an answer, anything below 73.8 bar is subcritical operation. So obviously you don't go very close to the critical point. So typically about 65 bar is what is the uh, maximum limit for subcritical operation. Because you have to accommodate the delta P also. Yeah, it depends so. also very much what is the pressure rating in standstill. Because that's mainly your, your major concern. As long as these systems are operating at the freezing, it's very low, t low pressure. But when it comes to standstill and what is your cold finger system doing, at which level you want to rate your rest of the system, that, that defines mostly. If you go 60 bar, 90 bar, depends. Yeah, generally in India, the standstill pressure is, uh, corresponds to uh, 40 degrees centigrade and our test pressures are approximately uh, 23 to 24 bar is the test pressure as of now. But that's just for, that will not uh, last because you need to have at least 40 or 60 bar. It depends on your cold finger and it depends on the charge on the volume. That will define your standstill pressure. Thank you very much. I can show you a graph, you can make a photo later. You can easily calculate it simply. Thank you very okay. much. Sir. So now, this is the last so before lunch, right? This is the... We might have one more. Okay, let's try. Actually, just... Uh, <laughs> yes. okay. I want to answer his question. Uh, yeah, please. That, uh, regarding this uh, condensers, no, you said, you, you can see the most of the compressor manufacturers, uh, they have operating uh, limits for their compressors. So based on the tech chart, you can see the, this thing. Okay, so you can design your condenser according to that. Yes, so now I want to bring you towards some cases, but before that I want to use the opportunity to tell you something about you may have heard, but you may have not completely understood what it really means, because we are talking global warming, we are talking ODP, ozone depleting, but this is a new category. This PFAS is something new. And after that, I bring you to the clean alternatives and some, su some stuff. So, just to, to bring us on stage, from the 80s, we have seen this. Professor Meyer had a nice slide on the, on the circle of life and the circle of refrigerants. We are back to green. We had this Montreal Protocol, which was first ever, it was ratified after only two years. It has never happened before and after to globally ratify something so quickly. That was good. And, but it triggered also the introduction of HFCs. We saw it in the, in the previous slide. But it also started the revival of CO2 actually by that time because car air conditioning was one of the most leaking systems by that time. And Gustav Lorenz said we need to do something there. And in commercial refrigeration, but also heat pump operation because of the properties. So there were two major focus areas, was mobile air conditioning and hot water heat pumps. And now we see six million heat pumps in Japan are working with CO2 to produce hot water because of the property. The Kyoto Protocol was not so successful. It took seven years and India, China didn't join, US also not. That's why it was not th the same pace as uh, Montreal Protocol. However, it introduced also a push on natural working fluids. We have the FGAS Directive, we have the Paris Agreement or the Montreal Protocol. This is all helped, but it, it's always a massive lobbying and pushing towards new synthetic fluids. And the question is, is this really the best for society? Let's see. So, State of the art is we use a lot of F gases, still we do, for decades. And they have severe impact on humans and the environment. We, have, we are now not using anymore, but we still have in stock a lot of ODP fluids, which are in operation. 
we use a lot of global warming fluids. However, now we have found out that there is a challenge because we have these decomposition products and as Professor Meyer already mentioned, they are going into the water. Not only the water, it's also the mother milk and other stuff I will show you later. So now we have a new action from government agencies towards this. This is not ODP, this is not climate change, this is chemical, this is something new. So, there was a proposal last month from these countries. The one flag I had to put in was from the Netherlands. It was Germany, Norway, Denmark, Sweden and the Netherlands. They made an approach to the European Chemical Agency, a proposal for restriction. Restriction, that's the word. Uh -huh. So, because there's a risk to the environment and human health, and that's severe. Uh, that's not a, uh, we can mitigate. Because of these fluids, these per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, that's the problem. And they have identified risk, and these agencies are supposed to help the society. They are not industrial driven, okay? So, it's a proposal for restriction. And these fluids, they are artificial substances. And they used everywhere. 10,000 of these substances are in, in our daily life. It's this Teflon in the pan when you fry stuff. It's on, this, on the clothes, everywhere, and refrigerants. So we are in the spotlight. We are on the target because we are using this stuff. And the scope of, the of this restriction, because these substances are very high persistence, they have a very high persistence, not, uh, and not very persistent, they are very high. That's very important. And they last longer than any arti other artificial chemical. So that's, that's the problem. Uh, they, they're not breaking down. They cannot be mineralized. And this concentration is increasing. It's not going down. You can measure in drinking water everywhere this, this uh, PFAS. And because mineralization, which normally breaks down, is not taking place. And to m remove this stuff from the groundwater, from soil and so on, is extremely difficult and costly. Who, who wants to pay for it? And it's probably not at all possible. So that's why it's like with DDT, PCB and all that, we need to find a solution. So, it's everywhere. That's the problem. It's really everywhere in the, in the organisms, in the drinking water, in our food. It's irreversible for now and the future generation. So it's in our responsibility to do something now, not in 30 years. Now. And what is even worse, at highly exposed communities, highly exposed communities, they have the highest level, of course. Here we have the most, in where we are living, we have the most number of air conditioning systems and all this stuff. So that's where it happens. <coughs> and what is the effect? Look at this. Increased cholesterol levels, liver damage, kidney cancer, testicle cancer, for the baby, delayed, reduced response of vaccines, lower birth weight. This is because we are putting this stuff into the environment. Of course, we try to keep it in our systems, but sooner or later it's leaking. That's the problem. So, the chemical scope is any substance which contains one fully fluorinated material, this CF3, or this CF2, part of the restriction, shall not be manufactured, used, or placed on the market. 
That's a very clear message. There is no maybe. Huh? Shall not be manufactured. There are some uh, ex uh, exceptions. For some systems below minus 50, or laboratory test equipment in centrifugal chillers. But there is also a deadline for them, but that's a bit later. E EFI means en entry into force when this restriction comes into force. It's very short. After that, it's very short. So, what does it mean? <coughs> These are the fluids. On, th on this side of the red line, these are the fluids which are on the list. And these are the blends which are on the list. And now I'm asking you, have you heard about these fluids before? Yes, you have. On the other side, you have the ones which are not producing PFAS, R32, because it has no, not the three fluorides. R23 does have the three fluorides, but it has a H on the other side. That's why it's accepted. But look at the GWP numbers. So the FCAS regulation and the Kigali amendment will take care of these fluids over there. The PFAS restriction will take care of this one. Because all this uh, global warming uh, agreements and so on have been kind of Penalized by this, they just say, "Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't harm the environment or the, the climate change." Yes, that's true, but the other problem is obvious. So that's why now the agencies have to the, have to do something to prevent humanity that these fluids are not going into the at, into the environment because creating all this problem, which is a threat to our health and food and children and generation. So that's the problem, that's the challenge, and that's why we should be happy that they do this, because we know there are solutions. So, before we go ahead, any question? So do you still think there are alternatives on this left side which you should continue to use? Because if you want to sell a system to Europe, you're at the dead end you will not be able to sell it. So why should you develop it, something? Why should you adapt something to this? Of course, you're allowed to use it in India. But is your soil, your mother milk, different from what we have in Europe? Is your water, drinking water less uh, important? I'm just asking. And this is not stopping at the border. Huh? It's everywhere. So, but. Don't worry, we have solutions. So I want to show you some of these clean alternatives which creates enough job for you and enough business. So don't worry, don't stick, don't drive the car with the back mirror which represents the other fluids. We should go ahead. And today we focus a little bit on CO2 mostly, but there are all the others, as nicely shown by Professor Meyer, we have propane, we have hydrocarbons, we have ammonia, we have water, we have air, we have all the, the recipes, all the stuff. This is one example from my Kawa, a Newton system where they have minimized the, the ammonia charge by 138, very low charge ammonia now, and they pump the CO2 towards the storage places and so on. This is a nice example of combining properties of fluids, very high energy efficiency and very high safety because only the CO2 goes to the cooling part. If you have a leak there, nothing is lost. Food is still saleable. One example. Now we come to the Navy and marine application. This is an example of a Norwegian fishing vessel. This was the R22 system. They converted at the same place to a CO2 system. And you see, they could increase the cooling capacity at the same space. And they could reduce the freezing time for that fish. I don't say you want to, to freeze your battleship, but this gives you an example on, on what is possible. And at the same time, the only complaint here was in this, this part, the people charging this freezing equipment 
normally they had a coffee break because 190 minutes it was a, there was time for a coffee afterwards because they had so many equipment they had no time to they need to charge all the time because it was ready before the coffee time was coming so that was the only complaint but the, the owner of the ship he was very happy because they could increase the quality of the fish because it was much faster when the catch came in before until it was frozen it was faster higher quality so it means we can do this kind of equipment much more compact there are many of these ships in Norway now and else where, we, where they use CO2 sometimes in combination with ammonia but I would say in the future even it might be possible to produce oil free compressors for this kind of systems which would be even more compact that would that that will come so I will think I think we will see this and our friends from CTS in the US they have developed several systems with CO2 for the US Army very compact and they, they are very happy because it's much easier to get CO2 when you're on a mission than a, a sophisticated refrigerant which is maybe not so easy to handle yeah, so CO2 you can get everywhere because everywhere where you find a bar that tapping beer there is CO2 so you, there's a CO2 cylinder so then you can recharge your system uh -huh. and even in, in many of the ships you use CO2 as the fire distinguisher so you have a CO2 on board actually so you can that's simple so there's a great potential and they, they use it now all, all the time the new fishing vessels they build are mainly built with CO2 now let's look, look into supermarkets this is an example to utilize a ejector as we have seen in the pictures before and thanks for my colleagues to introduce all this theory I can now go direct to examples without going into the details but here I want to spend a few minutes you see we have the two types of compressors because we have the freezing stuff here and the chilled food here we are compressing and it's possible to harvest 90 degree water if if you have a customer for that we may reject the heat or we may even use it at the lower temperature level we have this internal heat exchanger to make some superheat to protect the compressors it doesn't help too much on the ejector because it's reduced a little bit the potential but it is to secure the compressors that we always have superheat you need the internal heat exchanger this ejector will suck all the vapor from from these chilling cabinets towards the receiver so it lifts a few bar depending on the high ambient temperature depending on the high side pressure you can lift from one two three four bar uh, and that is the level where the compressor the empty compressor takes it away so whenever we have as showed before from uh, professor Pomod, when when the high and the outside temperature is low as you saw that sometimes this can go subcritical in that case we are already ready with the co2 after the heat rejection so we don't need this we can go straight we we op we, we open this valve and we send the liquid straight to the consumers because it's already cooled it's already liquid after that so we don't need the ejector but we still keep it very simple we suck all the vapor from this through the ejector and the pressure drop is 0.1 bar that's 0.1 Kelvin there's nothing we can suck it through and we can have in that case we anyhow have a very high COP high coefficient of performance we can even implement air conditioning in this this arrangement in the summer because the pressure temperature level is above five six degrees C around 40 45 bar so that's perfect for air conditioning if we need that part we can add this here so this represents a very simple system this is very simple we have seen much more complicated ejector systems which were hardly not used because they were not understood it's difficult to under, difficult to maintain because that's the next challenge we need to work together training of people experienced people who understand first to build it but also to maintain it that's why we believe in a simple system which which this one represents the first one is built now 
it was uh, shown at the Euroshop last uh, week, and it will be implemented in the southern Europe soon. But I, I hope many more will come, because this is really, you can't make it more simple than this. Huh? This is one example. Let me take another one. We talked about air conditioning. Professor Bamon said, okay, air conditioning only is challenging, but you should compare apples with apples. Because if you do an air conditioning with a, you, they call it mildly flammable refrigerant, what does it mean? You have to do an indirect system towards your shop. Uh, you're pumping water, 12-7 or whatever. And, and on the other side, you do a dry cooler. You have a, another indirect system where you go to the dry cooler and have that penalty on heat transfer. You have two times the penalty on heat transfer. If you go DX with CO2 into the shop, doing the evaporation in the air handling unit, and we do a gas cooling outside, maybe some spray at the last coils, direct to the coils, not the air, to the coils. We have done, in, in our Indy Plus team, we have done a calculation. In the area of Bangalore, as an example, annually, this would save money. So it it's, it's depends, of course, where you put it, probably Chennai or other places where it's high humidity and so on. It's a different story. We need something else. But many, many places, in the, also in this country, you could do, do this in this way. This was proposed for Metro to do it here in Bangalore, but it didn't. They were sold, and it was a challenge on that part. So the management couldn't decide yet. But no secondary loop, that's the clue. That's why we need to compare apple with apple. If you compare the inner part of the system with the low pressure fluid, it will not compete. But with all the, if you compare air temperature in the shop to ambient air, this will win. Yeah? Another example is hotels. And hotel is a no-brainer for CO2 because you need hot water and cooling at the same time. And whenever we have this, we can do some simple storage for the hot water. It's easy because we want to run this chiller 24-7 or 20 hours or whatever. And in the meantime, we store more or less water, which is then used in peaks, mainly in the morning and the afternoon hours. But with, with this storage, it is no problem to do. And, and the important thing is, when you, already, when you order these storage tanks, please order it with the diffuser in the bottom, because it is slowly charged from the heat pump. So the stratification is nice. So it's, it, the, when it's charged, this water is pushed like a column through these tanks, until it's getting warm here, then it's fully charged. Yeah? But in the morning, when 500 people are taking shower in the hotel at the same time, a lot of water has to be sent to the hotel. And then you, you have a real high stream going into each tank from the bottom. That's why you need to have a diffuse in the bottom to, to not destroy the stratification in the tanks. So if you don't do that, they, the stratification is killed and the hotel owner calls you, ah, but uh, the water is not uh, hot anymore. Yeah, so it's small details, but put that one. And the innovation we are doing here is, you see here is the ejector, and we have two evaporators. That's very important to understand. We are doing cooling in two stages, at two pressure levels. And the upper pressure level is taken care of by the compressor. The lower pressure level is taken care of by the ejector. That means we have a 5 to 6 Kelvin temperature difference in evaporation between the two stages. That means we can lift the suction of the compressor by 5 to 6 bar. You can provide 7 degree water, but your corresponding saturation temperature pressure is higher than 7. That is not possible if you have a low pressure fluid not taking disadvantage, you need to go to the lowest level and 5, 6, 7 Kelvin below for the supply. In our case, the compressor doesn't see this low pressure or temperature. Compressor is much high, suction is much higher, and that is COP. And at the same time, if you then produce 
80 degree, 90 degree water, the hotel owners will, they are, they are soon signing up for getting these systems. And as we have shown the first one. The first one is now installed at the Askaya Patra Foundation kitchen here in Bangalore, producing exactly cold water and hot water at the same time. It, it has arrived yesterday, built in by Aspiration Energy in Chennai. So, and, and there will be more. We have, in our project, we have another demonstrator in Goa, where they implement this, exactly this system at the moment in a hotel there. And we will have several, and we will show them, we will tell you what's going wrong and what's going nice. So you all can do it. Because this is, this is what we need in all the hotels. And as tourism has to be grown in this country, as I wrote in the newspaper, they want to build so many more hotels. It should be mandatory by the government to do this. And it will create a lot of jobs in India. We are not taking, we are building them here. They build here with your colleagues, with, you, with your support. That's nice. So we do the chilling of all the rooms and the hot water. And we do some thermal storage in between. And then this works. This can support everything. This is another way you could do that. Similar approach. If you have an apartment house with several, several parties, why should everybody have its own air conditioning, uh, copy paste, uh, and uh, having all these leaks and all the challenges? You could do simply by having a centralized system, store the water, and have a distribution with only four pipes. One is for hot water, one is for cold water, and one is the return of the cold water to cool it again. And in our part of the world, we are used to drink the tap water. Millions of liters of tap water are lost because people are opening the crane and waiting until it gets cold. Drinking water of the best quality is lost. In this case, when we do like this, we cool the water actively. We produce hot water with the heat and we send it to each flat. And there either you take it by the tap or if you have some cooling demand during the warmer days, you can heat exchange with the cooling loop and, and by this distributing into the buildings. And when you have, when everybody has an energy meter on this part, you can easily balance who has, who has to pay what. Hot water, cold water, and, and the heating, same time. You, you send the hot water there and it goes to the heat exchanger as when you take some heat and the returning goes back. And now the novelty will be you change your, you have, you divide your gas cooler into two. One is the preheating of the cold water to a level of about 30, 40 degrees. And then you can mix it with what comes back. That has also about 40 degrees. These two go together into the second gas cooler, the upper gas cooler. And then they are reheated back to 70, 80 degrees. By doing so, the heat pump will survive. It gets always cold at the last gas cooler. Suction line heat exchanger takes the rest. And here we use the ejector also to generate different temperature levels in the, in the heat uptake. And then this can be an energy well. It can be a river. It can be the sea. It can be an external heat exchanger, whatever. That's, that's possible. So this is another solution you can try to implement. And it's simple because it's only water going in the building and the energy system is very compact. New cars. Tata, he was the supporter of this institute. And nowadays, air conditioning is very important for cars. But for the new cars, the electric cars, heat pump is essential too. Otherwise, you are losing so much driving range if, if half of the battery is turned into hot air for the compartment. So if you look at Volkswagen's this ID3, ID4 cars going to Norway, all of them have CO2 as a heat pump fluid in the air conditioning. If you open the hood and you don't find this, you should give the car back. Even here. Why, why can't we do it here? It's possible. Bus. Bus air conditioning. 
Since 20 years, they do it in Convecta, this company that does it. And now even with heat pump, also same, same way, because we have new powertrains for buses, they need also heat. But air conditioning is also fully possible. And it's done in Europe. Many buses have already CO2 as air conditioning. Train, our friends from CTS, Stefan Elbel and uh, Lawrence, they, they did this for a train, high-speed train, CO2 system. And look, it was 14% more capacity on the same space, and the COP was 15% higher than 407C. So what's the problem? And that's always important also when we do the comparison. You made a comparison on the same capacity. I agree. But sometimes you, we should be fair and spend as much surface or as much volume to compare. And then we will see the advantage of CO2 that our temperature approach in the gas cooler, for example, gets very close. The temperature approach is the temperature of the cooling media coming in towards how close can we come with the CO2. And we can come close as one Kelvin in some time because of this gliding temperature. One Kelvin. And if you make some simple comparison, 10 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, you will penalize it. Yeah? But if we, if we design the, the heat exchanger, fair enough, same size, same volume available, we, we, we can become more efficient. That's, that's the clue. So, how to accelerate this implementation? I, I say the government and multilateral fund and so on, they should spend money, loan, not giving away money. They should give a loan to those investing in this for this additional cost in the beginning. Soon we will see there is no additional cost. In Norway, the supermarket system with CO2 is more cheap than the HFC system. So it, it's just a matter of how many, how is the competition, how is the, how is the production. But in the beginning, the risk, everybody puts risk is additional cost and so on. That should be covered by, by these fundings. So the investment should also follow the product. So the end user can pay back this by the money he, sa he or she saves when operating the unit. Because there is, there is an efficiency improvement. It has a cost in the beginning, and that cost is nobody willing to take. That is the problem. But if there would be this kind of initiatives, then nobody can blame it is more costly. No, it, you can pay back later. That should, that should be the way. That's my proposal. So, summary. Food is valuable. You should not lose it, and we should try to make our equipment very good. And safety at work is even more important. We cannot lose none of us. Also the workers, they are not growing on trees. And we need more of them. So we, don't, we should not lose them and we should not compromise safety. So safety Googles, but also these other fluids with all these decomposition products, doing welding and so on, big, big challenge. So, if we go the natural way, we are very safe. The impact I showed you. So let's focus on natural fluids and concentrate on this. And my last slide is from 2023 on, <coughs> reminded by this PFAS restriction. That should be the now the new discussion, not the global warming and ODP. This is the new thing. Our sector must leave the artificial reflection chapter now. How dare you to continue? The Swedish lady will tell you. And if your company is on the spotlight, your, your company boss is not happy. Yeah? How dare you? Look at the Kyoto Protocol by that time. I, I should have brought Coca-Cola was challenged. Climate Coke, HFC Coke. That was Greenpeace, how they manipulated their logo. And then right after, they changed. They cut all the HFCs. So pushing by NGOs and others, don't uh, think it's too, it can be tough. And we have the chance. What is the problem? You, if you make a sustainable program on developing the fluids we are talking today, it is possible. 
And it is not even creating more jobs and more turnover. So what is the problem? That is my question to you. What is the problem? Thank you. <laughs> yes, maybe there's a question or two. Sorry for maybe spending a bit more minutes. Fine. So we are really running behind time. So but I think if we can, we can just take maybe one question. Yeah, maybe, please. Yes, yes. You mean the, our friends from CTS? Yes, let me say. Yes, here, please. Let's see if he was 16% uh, better. It's better. Better, yes. Not worse, better. Of course. Possible. If you, do, if you know how to do a CO2 system and you really take care, then it is possible to outperform other systems. Yeah? If you do the right design on the gas cooler to reject all the heat and you have a temperature approach of one Kelvin and you continue on that path and you do a nice design on the evaporators and get the really high evaporating temperature still providing the same performance capacity, then it is possible. Yes, not the same design, the same space. Yeah. The same space and the same fans and all this. The only the cycle is different. Yes. Yes. And they shipped it to a country not far away from here. So hopefully they will copy. <laughs> Pardon? Heat is completely wasted. Yeah, in this case it's a high speed train for air conditioning. But I, I think it's, uh, for some of the uh, train, it's, uh, it's possible to do a reversible system in case you need a heat pump. Okay, in this case, this is considering the complete heat wastage. Yeah, yeah. The COP. Yes, the COP, this is for air conditioning. Capacity was 40, you see, it was even more on the, around 40 kilowatt for one compartment. That's typically what you see on, on top of one compartment. You, you can go here to this, uh, we, we share it. This is on atmosphere.org. You can download the whole presentation and, and look yourself. There are many other nice examples from the Navy or from the Army. They have shown in the same slide. So we share, it's shared here if you, if you go there. Yes, of course. If you do the right job, you, you can outperform your competitors. We can help you. Good. Any other question before we continue? We are really later, short later. of time. <laughs> Thank you. We are a little bit behind schedule, but I think we'll probably make up. We'll have the next talk by Mr. Um, Sonal. So he will talk about the policies. Is that? Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I am Sonal. I work with Council on Energy, Environment, and Water uh, in the Sustainable Cooling Program. So uh, I will be talking on uh, what are the policies uh, driving refrigerant transitions in India and uh, what are its uh, expected timelines. Uh, I also realize that I am standing between you and your uh, anticipated break, so I will be try. I will try to cover it fast. And also, some of the points has already been covered by Professor Armin, Professor Meghya, and Professor Kumar. So, so uh, CW. Uh, so we work for impacting uh, sustainable development at a scale, and we are a team of 200 uh, plus multidisciplinary professionals. So I will not go into much of the details. Uh, quickly coming to the point. Uh, so. Uh, 
uh, Professor Maya has covered it in detail. So what are the factors uh, impacting the choice of refrigerants? And there are various parameters related to technical, safety, cost, and environmental. Uh, but uh, what is the main guiding factor behind the policies in India particularly? So, is, is, so these are the environmental parameters. And these includes uh, ozone depleting potentials, global warming potential, and also what will be the impact of these refrigerants on the overall system efficiencies? Because we use, uh, uh, we also have program uh, basically on uh, efficiencies of the systems, standard and leveling program. So all these environmental parameters, and these are uh, basically driving the policies, uh, policy development in India for refrigerant transitions. So. Uh, uh, this has also been covered, but uh, just to show that uh, uh, from natural, we had shifted to CFCs in around 1930s. Then uh, uh, because of its ozone depletion potential, we have this Montreal Protocol. And it came in 1987, and it uh, basically uh, uh, asks for moving away from gases which depletes the ozone layer. And then HCFCs were an intermediate alternatives, uh, having a uh, much lower ozone depleting potential. And uh, after that, uh, uh, the world is uh, either shifting to or have shifted to HFCs, uh, which have uh, zero ozone depleting potential and very high global warming potential. And now uh, people are shifting to HFOs. And then again, we are talking about natural refrigerants. So different countries are at different stages of this refrigerant transition pathways. And in India, we are currently uh, at this stage. So we are uh, implementing programs which are targeted as phasing out uh, HCFCs. We have already phased out CFCs. And now we are adopting HFCs. And in future, we will be also transitioning away from high GWP HFCs to uh, refrigerant gases having lower uh, global warming potential. So I will not go into much of detail. Uh, many points has already been covered. But uh, 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 we shifted to CFCs because of uh, many advantages. But uh, because of this ozone depleting potential, uh, we have phased out. And India has also uh, basically adopted this Montreal Protocol. And uh, it has already phased out uh, completely the CFCs. So we have completely phased out CFCs. Uh, in the next slide, you can see. So we have uh, adopted a country program for phasing out ODS in 1990s. And it was followed by uh, ozone depleting substance regulation and control rules in 2000. And we have several amendments in the last two decades in uh, this ODS rules, uh, depending upon uh, the emerging needs and requirements. So uh, we had set a target of phasing out uh, CFC is still 2010, but uh, we have achieved much before that in 2008. And these are some of the numbers showing what are the impacts of uh, this program. So how many uh, ODP tons we have avoided uh, because of these regulations and programs. Uh, now, uh, post-2010, we are in a process of phasing out HCFCs, which were uh, uh, in intermediate alternatives to CFCs. So uh, this is the timelines which India is currently following. So we have adopted an accelerated phase out program. And we are targeting to uh, reduce uh, HCFC's production and use by 97.5% by 2030 and 100% uh, and elimination by 2040. So 2.5% will be there to meet the servicing requirement of the equipments which are already installed in the market. So these are our target. And to meet these targets, uh, uh, India has adopted uh, programs in phases. So it, these are called HCFC phase out management plan. So a stage one was from 2011 to 2015 and targeted at uh, meeting this 2015 target. And uh, we have well uh, achieved this target. So we have to reduce our consumption to 1447. But we have uh, reached below 1300 uh, by, uh, by the start of 2015. Now we are in the process of implementing HCFC stage 2, uh, which will be completing now. And uh, HCFC phase 3 plan is also ready. And it, it is expected to launch very soon. Uh, so basically, these are targeted uh, at uh, meeting these uh, uh, targets of 2020 and 2025. And then phase three will be uh, aiming at meeting the target of 2030. So basically, then by 2030, we will be uh, almost uh, uh, phasing out the production and use of HCFCs. 
and we have already started using a lot of HFCs uh, uh, in our cooling devices, but yes, uh, it has certain advantages, but also disadvantages in terms of uh, high global warming potential. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, this Kigali amendment came into picture. We had Paris Agreement, which talks about global warming and uh, asked countries to come together to take actions uh, to mitigate the climate change issues. And uh, it was followed by Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which talks about uh, shifting away from high global warming potential refrigerant gases to low global warming potential gases. So uh, India has also ratified this. and. Uh, so I will quickly cover this. These are some of the uh, HFC gases predom predominantly being used in India. And you can see the global warming potential, so ranging from uh, 700 to uh, 4,000, 5,000. So that means one kg of this refrigerant will cause that much of global warming that is caused by one kg, uh, one kg of uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, why it is important for Indian perspective is because uh, we we have very low penetration of cooling devices currently. So whether it is uh, in residential sector, room air conditioners, all in cold chains, or in transport sector, so transport sector. So we are at a very low penetration level, and uh, because of also heat stress and going uh, increasing uh, hotter days, so it is expected that uh, our uh, demand for cooling devices will grow exponentially. Uh, the India Cooling Action Plan launched in 2019, so it uh, predicts that uh, the cooling demand will grow by 8 to 11 times in the next two decades. So if we do not phase out HFCs, so this is how our uh, uh, GHG emissions will, be, will look like in the next uh, 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 three decades. And so basically almost 500 uh, million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2050. So that is why it is very important to uh, phase out from the Indian perspective. Uh, globally also, many of you will be aware that if we, if we uh, phase out SFC, so it will help in uh, basically uh, reducing the global warming by 0.5%, uh, which would have been caused in the absence of any HFC phase out by 2100. So these are the timelines uh, uh, for India. So India will be uh, uh, will be a starting phasing out of HFCs after 2028. So for India is basically in the group two of Article Five parties. So Article non-Article Five parties are developed countries, and Article Five parties are in a sense developing countries, and India is in the group two. So. Uh, the baseline years will be 2024, 25, and 26. So whatever will be the total consumption of uh, refrigerant gases, so that will form the baseline. And then our uh, phase down will start after 2028. So and uh, initially, the targets are, uh, in a sense, uh, lenient. So 10% reduction by 2032, 20% uh, by 2037, and 30% by 2042. So in the next uh, uh, two decades, we will be reducing 30% uh, of our uh, baseline uh, HFC emissions. But after that, there is a steep target. So in next five years, it has to be reduced from 30% to 85%. So this is the uh, agreed timeline for India. Uh, and uh, India has already started. So in December last year, uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, they have already started uh, the steps for developing strategies for HFCs phase down. And right now, a uh, lot of consultations are being planned. In fact, today afternoon also, there is one stakeholder consultations to uh, get feedback on uh, developing this HFC phase out strategy for India. And a lot of data is being collected and uh, feedback and suggestions is gathered to develop this strategy. So again, now uh, coming back to uh, this slide so just to show that we are currently here and we have we are in a uh, uh, in a stage where we are looking for alternative uh, 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 for high gwp hfcs so now uh, 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 we have to decide like uh, we we have to move out from here and this is the usual path which many of the countries has taken and uh, we have now solutions available here so now we have to think uh, which kind of path india uh, should take. So whether we have to go from high GWP refrigerant to low GWP uh, HFCs and then HFO or natural or from HFC to HFO 
or we can directly leapfrog from HFT, HFCs to natural refrigerants. And because we have now two, three years time frame from now to decide on this strategy because we will start implementing it in 2028. So it is also an opportunity for us to, because for a policy, uh, we require sufficient data set, sufficient uh, pilots, sufficient demonstration of not only the technical feasibility, but also the uh, commercial and economic feasibility of that, and also practicality, so how it can be used in different applications, so like smaller units, bigger units. So all these things, so we have, uh, so I think it is the right time for uh, the community sitting here, academic, industries, NGOs, and all, to basically uh, uh, provide uh, uh, or build that confidence or build the case so that we can, uh, when we uh, launch our strategy for phasing out of HFC, so we can, we can leapfrog uh, so that we can avoid uh, the other environmental impact because currently we are concerned with ODP and GWP, but there is a lot of talk and Armin has uh, uh, explained like there are other environmental impacts. So uh, evaluating those impacts and finding solutions which we can help in avoiding going through uh, that path where we are basically uh, avoiding one impact but creating the other impacts. Uh, there is another point uh, which I like to highlight that <coughs> We are basically, all these Montreal Protocol and Kigali amendments, so this, these are focused mostly at uh, reducing the production and use of uh, certain gases which have Im impacts. But uh, we, have, we will have a lot of equipment running on these gases because once we start phasing down after 2028 and we have uh, the initial few years, we have a linear target. So uh, uh, the, uh, the cooling devices which are in market now and which will be added in the next 10, 15 years. So that will be with uh, these kind of gases which have environmental impacts. So currently, uh, this life cycle refrigerant management is a missing link uh, in Indian policies. So there are few countries who have adopted like, uh, uh, so refrigerants and then it goes to cooling devices. So here installation and then uh, operating life of cooling devices is there. And then end of life, uh, at the end of life, these devices are discarded. So currently, uh, a lot of refrigerant leakage is happening here. So in India, it is estimated that 40 to 45 percent of the refrigerant which we consume is goes in servicing, and that means to basically top up or recharge the leakages leaked uh, equipments. And then at end of life, when the equipment is discarded, so all that refrigerant is getting leaked into the environment. So currently, this is the meeting, uh, missing link. And under uh, under the ND Plus project, we are now also working on. Uh, developing a life cycle refrigerant management plans which can take care of the leakages happening here and also how we can recover the refrigerant at end of life and either reclaim and reuse it or we safely destroy it so that uh, we can avoid the, its impacts also. So uh, with that, uh, I'm concluding my uh, talk, so thank you. And if uh, there is any questions, so we can quickly take that. <laughs> Are there any policies framed on the usage of source of fuel used for the industrial process heating lesser than 140 degrees Celsius? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat uh, fuel? Uh, on the sources of fuel that are used, like briquettes, diesel. So briquettes are widely used. So when it comes in comparison with the heat pumps, so economically it is not feasible. So there is uh, no more interest to employ or the penetration of heat pumps into the uh, industries. So 140 degrees, lesser than 140 degrees Celsius, if any restriction is put on the so usage of source of fuel, then it will be a very useful. Yeah, so it is slightly, I think, deviating from the topic, but I, I have some idea of some of the industries, not all the industries, which use uh, diesel or furnace oil or uh, uh, electric heaters to, uh, for the uh, process heat requirements, so to generate, to generate hot water or steam, or some other, uh, uh, generating hot air also. So uh, it's uh, so currently there is no restrictions on the 
type of fuel one can use but uh, in a densely industrial area where there is lot of issues of air pollution so there regulations are from the air pollution side to basically so there are some standards for ambient air quality also from uh, standards for stack emissions and also uh, like in ncr so i belong to ncr so there now uh, in uh, smaller industries are asked to shift to either natural gas or electric heating to avoid burning of fossil fuels which is causing lot of air pollution so from that perspective there are some regulations but i am not aware of all the industries we can have just maybe one question So my question, which I was asking earlier, is there any work ongoing at this moment, you know, to devise some kind of a regulation to promote how maybe some subsidy can be provided to uh, the manufacturers? Because the initial cost, as, the, uh, as Professor Armin was also mentioning, in the initial stage, it is going to be on a higher side. Now to, to pitch our product, which is based on the natural uh, refrigerant, which is CO2, etc., we need to compete with the existing uh, units, which is heat, heat pump or anything uh, like that. So how is there any thought process? So, uh, so currently there is no any subsidy. If you are to, uh, ask for any current program, so currently there is no subsidy for any uh, CO2 systems. But we have in the past uh, several programs targeted at uh, basically uh, uh, subsidizing or providing some sort of grants to uh, develop these kind of systems or to help them in becoming market ready. So for example, when this uh, uh, in the uh, HCFC phase out management plan 2, uh, there were some grants provided to industries to develop uh, uh, in production line based on uh, R290 refrigerant. So I think Godrez is one of the beneficiary who have provided some grants and they have uh, developed that separate production line and come up with those uh, uh, air conditioners based on R290. Uh, in other sectors also, there are programs, so there are examples. Uh, so if uh, one can make a good case, like uh, also explaining what are the business models and what kind of and what level of grant support is required. So I think uh, in India generally it's a tendency to uh, uh, provide those kind of uh, support. So uh, because recently I was looking at uh, e-waste policies. So because that is also linked with end of life management of air conditioners. So there also a uh, lot of recycling facilities were set up. By, and for that also government has provided some subsidies. So similar kind of programs are there but cannot uh, current. The, the reason, I'm sorry, the reason yeah. why I'm asking this question, you were showing some of the targets yeah. by when India has to reach what, right? So when we are saying with respect to some target, that means commercially also it, we need to promote this. And if we cannot promote it, how we will be able to achieve those targets? And that is only possible uh, because in the initial, the cost is going to be on a higher side. So my request is if you have not yet uh, started thinking on that direction, so if you can think and we can maybe later some, uh, we can come out with some kind of a regulation, uh, either restricting the use of HFC, maybe putting some kind of a more taxes to that, or promoting this by giving some subsidy, either way. Yeah. So anyway, that uh, strategy is currently being developed and a lot of these kind of feedbacks are coming in. So hopefully there will be uh, uh, something which can basically uh, make it more feasible. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll have one more for today and this session now and then we are running behind time but we'll have the other two immediately after lunch then. Okay. Thank you.
So good afternoon. Uh, so before I start, since we are in an institute, I will probably do what uh, some of my professors used to do before a lunch. That is, uh, can I have a raise of hands to see who all are awake? <laughs> okay. Now since I have the attention of uh, everyone, so uh, good afternoon and uh, firstly uh, I would like to thank uh, Indy Plus, uh, IIT Madras and uh, IISC for uh, having uh, Danfoss to work alongside uh, with all of you in this, in this very important work uh, that we are doing uh, especially in uh, India where uh, obviously the mission for Danfoss and uh, for India especially what we have uh, heard from the Prime Minister is on uh, green growth and uh, when we talk of green growth, growing sustainably is what it means and uh, this journey of what we are discussing here becomes very important uh, in that journey. So, so we are very thankful for having Danfoss, uh, which, which believes that we, we can play a very important role in this decarbonizing journey uh, to have, 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 have us along with uh, all of you. Uh, the topic uh, has been on development of CO2 components from Danfoss, that's the topic. But I know for a fact uh, the advantage that I have here is uh, that I have many people in this room who probably know much more about what Danfoss products are there on the CO2 space than what probably some of us in Danfoss know because that's, that's what I have seen while working with uh, many of you. But I will, I will definitely try and cover what, what uh, it is uh, there in this. And one aspect that I would also cover as we move forward is uh, in terms of uh, when we have started this journey uh, a couple of years ago and which I continue to hear from many stakeholders within the industry is why is it challenging for us to adopt some of these technologies uh, in India? And there are, there are many reasons, many, many reasons that uh, come in which are all technical in nature and many of, uh, many of them are not wrong. They are not wrong, but I can't say that they are right. And uh, it is important for us to recognize that we are sitting in this, this building which is, which is probably uh, built by the visionary Tatas. And at that time when, when they looked at uh, developing uh, IISC in India, I don't think there was anything like IISC even conceptually in India. So if you had spoken to anybody at that point in time, I don't think it was possible. But they made it possible. So my, the way at least what we look at is that it is not that what has worked elsewhere will have to work in India. But we have to decide what is green growth for us what is it that will work in India and start looking at working in that direction and probably I will probably cover that before I get into what, what are the components that are there from uh, Danfoss side in this because that is something that, that is available for all of us and we can definitely move in that direction. What you see on this slide here is uh, the Danfoss position on refrigerants. Danfoss is a Denmark based company. It is about 90 year old. It was founded in 1932. And the DNA of Danfoss right from inception has been energy efficiency while today sustainability and all of this is, is the talk. But Danfoss has been, has been in this right from the beginning. What, what you see here are the refrigerants that are there and uh, what are the refrigerants that are from, from, from a futuristic point of view and all of that are there. But I, what I would want to focus your attention more on is that CO2 systems are becoming much more of a standard everywhere all across. And Danfoss own position on refrigerants because while we continue to support 
on all of the refrigerants because we have been working with all the stakeholders in this industry for, for the last 90 years. Our own position moving forward is that we have to look at solutions which are low GWP and natural in, in, in their uh, outlook. That's where we are investing. Every year we invest about 4.5% to 5% of our turnover globally into R&D and innovation. Our 2022 turnover was about 10 billion euros and about 4.5% goes back into innovation and that innovation is moving in this direction. And that's where I think where I would want to bring in what are we doing here at IISC. And that's very important because from a components point of view or from what we bring on to the table on natural refrigerants, that's already there. It's, 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 it's a mandate in many, because Danfoss is a, is a multinational, we are present in about 100 countries, and in many countries, it's only CO2 that sells. So a lot of components are already available. So wh why are we here? So about two years ago during COVID, we, you, you also saw the message from my president. We signed an MOU with IISC as a part of the green strategic partnership which India, in, the Prime Ministers of India and Denmark signed in terms of how can Denmark help India in this green growth. Especially the, 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 the Sc Scandinavian countries have a lot of technologies which they have developed which are applicable there which need not necessarily be replicated in India but we can look at how, how can we adapt them how can we re-engineer them for India? So as a part of that, we signed an MOU with Indian Institute of Science here. And uh, what you see here is that the engagement is on low GWP and natural refrigerants. And we, we are working on five pillars. This is, we, we are about two years old into this MOU. And the traction has been exceedingly well. Clearly what we are looking at, the first pillar is on sustainability. And that's where I, what I was saying was we should start looking at building ourselves, building a community of practice within the stakeholders in India on what does it need to do to look at maybe CO2, maybe propane, maybe isobutane, maybe something else. But what works for India? And it, it could be different for different applications. How do we look at them and how can we work together on, on those aspects and take that forward? Look at applications which are low hanging. While, while we did see what the Montreal Protocol tells us, what the Kigali Amendment tells us, we need not act till 2032. And that's, that's what I get to hear when I speak to a lot of people because the Kigali Amendment only asks India to act after 2032. So do we sit and wait till 2032 and look at somebody else telling us what to do? Or do we develop what works for India, start looking at it. At least the direction that I am seeing from a lot of stakeholders in the last six months is that we are making very rapid progress in this direction. We are having very, very active leads which are looking at getting converted into projects very soon. So, so that's a very positive news as far as I see in terms of the direction that we are seeing. More importantly, look at pilot projects and I must say that we should be very thankful to Navy. Invariably, we all know that Defense Forces and Navy wake up much earlier than the rest of us, literally. And even in this case, I think they have kind of shown us the direction. By saying that this works in India, it has been working for many, many hours. Absolutely no issues. There, there would be some teething issues. And they are there here, thank, thanks that they came to this workshop because a lot of us can learn from them what, what is it that they have seen. And we can learn from them and see what, what can we implement there. The third pillar I think is where we have to invest a lot more time. Because while at the end of this day a CO2 or these natural refrigerants provide cooling or heating like what the other refrigerants do, but the way CO2 operates, the pressures at which CO2 operates is, is very, very different to what any of us have known who have been in the industry. And that's one of the reasons for us to start saying, will this work? Will, will my guys be able to start looking at it? 
and that that is where i think some of us who who have been in this at least this room who who the, the people in this room who have who have put their front foot forward in taking this discussion forward will be able to help us you know because if we learn and if we can develop people who 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 can learn this that's when this will take off from the shelf to the factory level because we have seen it works all of us were very very skeptical when we were trying the system that we were developing with indian navy you saw some of the videos and all the all of that was happening we were all we were not sure how but but we all once it started working we said okay it's it's not it's not a devil i mean it, it's something that that that's as easy as it gets so so we need to start looking at developing those skill sets and that's where i think uh, we we have also started working with uh, indian institute of science in developing a specific program and curriculum which uh, we want to offer it to the industry along with experts from the industry where we, a certificate can be given on co2 and its applications and what what technical aspects can be brought in and i think it's, it's important that the skill and capacity is taken care of policy is very important while while i did hear some some comments on what kind of subsidies and those elements come in while while that's an aspect that we 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 can look at at some point in time but it is important to have standards for co2 as a refrigerant in india and that's that, that's an area where we have already started working with bis we have had uh, two meetings with them we have already exposed them with what co2 is and as an industry we are we are taking that discussion forward because we we have developed a standard for natural refrigerants especially ammonia the safety standards have been developed over the last two years now the next step is to some, some of the colleagues are here who have worked with me on that uh, standard as well and it's important these two steps that we take that that we become self reliant you know because if you if you look at hvc acr industry in india it's either technology that we get from japan or europe or us that we implement here in india but we should start looking at developing our own technologies you know because th that's where this this partnership between institutes and industry and the 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 other stakeholders that are there will help us in developing an ecosystem so that we can start looking at developing our own products our own portfolio and we start manufacturing in india because the biggest challenge is that we we have a lot of demand here but we we, we also need to see how we can build that ecosystem in india so that we can have a lot more manufacturing uh, in india so those are the five pillars in terms of what we are looking at from a danfoss uh, iac engagement point of view and uh, this is something over the last two years what we have seen as low hanging applications this is this is something which i which a lot of the others also have said and uh, for for those interested in this area i think uh, this is something that i wanted to say that while while it is something that we are running after but it helps if everybody runs after it's good to have competition and clearly what we are seeing is that transcritical and subcritical these are the two areas that there are opportunities in india what we have also seen is while it is a very interesting debate to have on cop and life cycle cost and what it is and all of this and these systems may actually prove to be beneficial than the other systems it's very difficult to change the mindset of people on ground so what we are looking purely from a business point of view is we have start stop looking at cooling applications we have started looking at applications where there is a heating load and cooling is a by product i think so someone mentioned in the morning that we we cooling is free because if you start comparing on price versus existing chillers we will not win that battle with the people who are going to argue on us with that it's it's a very very difficult thing probably we will win it at some point in time but right now it is it is better to change the direction look at where they are not attacking and that's how we that's one of the reasons why we have started seeing traction in the last 6 months these are the slides which are more on components uh, i will not get into the details of this but i have two of my colleagues here uh, ramesh maiso uh, 
uh, maybe Ramesh, you can just uh, stand. So Ramesh, uh, he leads our uh, the, the the entire uh, CO2 design and uh, the, the the business uh, for India. We also have Kundan, who is who is a doctorate in uh, CO2 from this own institute, and uh, both of them are there. They are experts on everything that we have uh, on CO2 products. So after this, I'll not get into the details of this. After this, you can ask them anything on this. But in principle, as far as transcritical goes, except for receivers and heat exchangers, we have everything else. And uh, subcritical, we have more or less everything that is required. And I, I should also mention that in transcritical, we also have the compressors now, uh, thanks to our colleagues from Bok. And uh, in conclusion, while, while what is written there, you can read uh, what is written there. Uh, but uh, but uh, what, what I would want to leave you with is uh, the last point is where I think we need to spend a lot more of our energies on in, in how can we develop the skill levels that are required to adapt these systems. Because these natural ref refrigerants or low GWP refrigerants are not going to be the same as what we have been using. So we need those skill levels that are needed in the market. And unless that is there, we can have the best of technology, it will stay on the shelf. So that's, that's where I think uh, a lot of us uh, should work on. And uh, from a Danfoss point of view, we are there. We, 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 we have the portfolio and we will continue to invest further in innovation. And we would, at least I would like not only that we innovate those products in India, we, we, we have a 50 acre campus in Chennai, so, so I would also want all of it to be manufactured uh, in India. We also now have a campus in Bangalore, so we, we, we would want to manufacture more and more in India, for India, of India. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. So, if there are any questions for Krishna, you can have maybe one or two. If not, then let's get some energy respect for lunch. So, yeah, uh, see, your uh, Dan Force is uh, present worldwide. Now, how do you see, you know, uh, the use of refrigerants? Uh, you know, as you mentioned, in UK, when it comes from US, when it comes from Japan, you know, they don't use the same refrigerants. So, obviously, you know, you will also have a different product portfolio for uh, the particular refrigerant. How do you yeah. see this scenario? So like I said, from a Danfoss point of view, uh, because we are present in about 100 countries and we, we, we follow the regulations everywhere, wherever we are. And uh, we, we have the portfolio for every refrigerant that is needed there. But if a particular refrigerant is not to be sold with a particular product, then that product is not sold with that refrigerant there. Like, like in the case of Europe, we don't sell anything with HCFCs. But we can sell that in India. So, so we still sell that in India because at the end of the day, we have to take care of our customers. While we have our vision to move the industry towards a particular direction, at the same time, we also have to take the customers along with us. So that's that's what we do. Uh, is it that you know, you know, uh, in certain countries, you know, there is a you know a set uh, you know uh, mindset to go for uh, you know, few refrigerants. Maybe a refrigerant you know, a product used in UK, they have uh, some refrigerant. And if it is in US, it is uh, maybe R134A. If it comes from Japan, it's something else. And maybe in Korea, it's something else. See, broadly, the, every country is following the regulations that they are mandated. Europe is following FGAS. US was following Kigali. They moved out of it. I don't know if they have come back now with Biden coming back in. So everybody is ratifying Kigali, so, so they are following the mandate. So there is nothing like I will buy a refrigerant manufactured here or there because refrigerants are invariably manufactured everywhere. You get the license and you start manufacturing it and you pay the license fee to the... And I am not a refrigerant manufacturer, so I can't say much about that. We will discuss further. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions we can have during lunch? But <laughs> Just an announcement that you can actually leave your bags here, so this room will be locked, so it's safe. Okay, so we can just walk for lunch. So lunch is in, arranged in the main guest house, so it's about 10 minutes, maybe 6 minutes walk from here. So we will uh, uh, 
So if you get lost somewhere in the campus, make sure that you are here by about 2.15. Uh, okay. So this is called the main building. So this is the faculty, um, I think it's the faculty hall in the main building. All right, thank you. You can follow one of us to the main guest house. So it's just on the road to the right and then you walk straight, then you'll hit the
हेलो सर प्रेजेंटेशन हाँ वो तार आन करना है प्रेजेंटेशन हेलो हाँ सर स्नैच्स फोर थर्टी एल कंफर्म दैट प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर एल कंफर्म वंस इट्स वुड बी फोर आर फोर आई थिंक Yes, sir. Yeah. So, 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 so,
so welcome back after lunch so i hope the energy doesn't put you to sleep <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah so dogrin you have a you have a tough session to keep them away <laughs> okay so uh, our next speaker is uh, dr dogrin uh, asfel so he is going to talk about i mean the titles out here the policies and practices on natural refrigerants in norway so i think some of the things that have helped the european union towards adoption of natural refrigerants is something that i think we can take a leaf out of it and also see if it can be adopted in the indian context so without wasting much time we will welcome togrim and thank you it's for you thank you so everybody are here not everybody but <laughs> okay i uh, i start i'm uh... I'm Torgrim Aspil from the Norwegian Environment Agency and I will talk about uh, policies and practices on nat natural refrigerants. Uh, I will talk about Norway but uh, to make it uh, more interesting and relevant I can also say that most of what I say is also relevant in the European uh, context because we are a member of the EA we are not a member of the U union but we are have the agreement with the union so we uh, Im implement most of the policies in the European Union. And uh, why I'm here is because we are a part of the Indie project where we cooperate with the uh, CEW on uh, policies. So this is uh, some kind of input from from us to how uh, you might uh, also do this in India but of course the situations are very different so it will probably also be uh, differences in implementation but anyway we have uh, also uh, in in the in the plus project we also work more specifically with uh, the policies on end of life treatment of uh, refrigerants um. there yeah uh, this slide has been showed already at least two times today so i will not go into to details uh, but uh, as uh, regards norway we are now in a phase where we are facing down hfcs and we have uh, two pathways to go and it's natural refrigerants or it's hfos or a combination of course so and depending on the refrigerants we also will have different uh, policies and uh, regulations which i will uh, talk uh, more about uh, some uh, versions of this figure also are like uh, professor maya said it was a, a circle and of course it can be a circle uh, because the, the refrigerants are the same both uh, long time ago and the future ones but uh, of course the technology is uh, much more modern now than it used to be before you, got the uh, also depleting substances yes uh, and uh, the consideration for choice of future refrigerants uh, there are a lot of considerations that most of them have uh, already been uh, touched upon by previous uh, 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 people here but uh, I only briefly go through them Uh, the main focus after uh, we got rid of most of the ozone depleting substances has been uh, the global warming uh, potential and um, that's also the main uh, focus on uh, the EU HFC regulation and also the Kigali uh, agreement uh, but of course uh, uh, the refrigerant by itself is not enough uh, if it uh, if the energy efficiency is uh, is not so high it's uh, it's not uh, so good even if you what you save on um, refrigerant uh, gvp you gain in the other end by gvp's release from the production of the energy so all uh, alternatives also have to be energy efficient 
And then we have the other environmental aspects which uh, uh, Armin talked a lot about, and uh, so I will not go into more into detail about that, but uh, of course as regards uh, the HFOs, it's uh, uh, the recent concerns about uh, PFAS and TFA that uh, are very, very important, and even for, for the, some of the other natural refrigerants, you also have some environmental concerns, especially for ammonia. Uh, it can be uh, both uh, concerns as to, uh, it's mainly ammonia, but uh, the, the natural refrigerants that had also other environmental effects. And then we have the health and occupant uh, worker safety that's um, uh, also mainly uh, related to ammonia but also to, as was mentioned here, in CO2, if you get very high concentrations, you can have a danger uh, to health. And the same is true for propane. If you have very high concentration, this can also be dangerous to health, as you know. When, when propane is used in cooking, and so it's also important to have safety measures to, to avoid leakage. Um, and it's also, of course, uh, the explosion uh, Risk as regards to propane. And then uh, it is the market uh, considerations like uh, costs and uh, availability of uh, refrigerants. Um, uh, they are, uh, the natural refrigerants are in a very good position since they are easy to make, uh, no patents and so. And avail availability is also important and also to restrict the, the use of different refrigerants is many aspects also important. For example, as regards air conditioners in cars, it's not so attractive to have many different refrigerants. The, the maintenance service, people want it simple and they want at best to have one or two refrigerants to choose from. So there they have landed at the one HFO at the moment, but it might be also more relevant for, for example, CO2 in the, in the future, even propane, I think. Uh, and then we have the robustness, uh, uh, also like end of life recovery, which, which I come back to. If, if uh, the refrigerant is so uh, safe or environmental friendly to use that you don't need to, to normally co collect it or you can accept uh, small releases, it's also much more easy to, to use the refrigerant than if you have to take great care of, of leakage. And then it's uh, the final and very important aspect that I think it's important that now the next solutions are the long-term solutions. So no more fluorinated gases that uh, has to have to be phased down again in a few years. So, and then of course you have the only solution is the natural refrigerants. Uh, here is just a summary of uh, different uh, uh, aspects as regards uh, these different uh, um, alternatives, HFOs and three natural refrigerants. Uh, I have mentioned uh, many of these uh, all already. Uh, what uh, is, uh, I think, also a very important uh, thing that has been mentioned so much uh, today is that uh, the end of life uh, treatment. Uh, I think for, for HFOs, uh, uh, it's po uh, you possibly have to have uh, more or less the same kind of uh, end-of-life treatment as we have in Norway and EU at the moment. That will see that, say that uh, we collect all the used gas by end of life and also uh, collect most of the gas from um, servicing and so 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 to all unnecessary leakage is uh, avoided. As regards to CO2, that's probably not uh, a big issue because the global warming uh, potential for CO2 in this context is negligible. So uh, the, I think the best way to deal with the CO2 by end of life is just to release it as long as the concentrations are not so high that they represent a danger to, to health and safety. Uh, that's not the case for uh, ammonia. Uh, that should definitely be uh, collected by end of life since it 
can, uh, its emissions to air are not that good, and uh, also ammonia to, to water, if you have high concentrations of ammonia in water, it's uh, uh, deadly for fish and so. And for hydrocarbons, might be something in between CO2 and ammonia. Uh, under small, uh, good vented uh, spaces, it might be okay to release some of it. If it's large amounts, uh, it might be more discussed if it's uh, feasible to, to release it. Um. Yeah, uh, so the, the way forward, um, as I said, uh, natural refrigerants uh, are the only final so solution as long as I see it. Uh, we have to consider uh, health and safety, and of course not all applications are yet major for natural refrigerants. That's also mentioned previously here, for example, very low temperature applications and so. Uh, the refrigerants are readily available and cheap, no patents. That's, uh, I think it's, it makes it much easier to employ them. Um, and uh, we also have still to focus on uh, energy efficiency. Mm. And the policies, uh, uh, existing policies focus mainly on um, uh, synthetic refrigerants, that's the Montreal Protocol, uh, Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, and also the EU uh, regulation. It's uh, mainly uh, uh, focused on, uh, well, mainly or only focused on the, the uh, fluorinated refrigerants. Uh, and as regards regulation, uh, this also means that uh, the responsibility for a regulation will be, be shifted. When it started with the ODSs, it was the people or government uh, bodies working with ODSs that were uh, key to the regulation. Then we got uh, the climate effects, and it was different people then that uh, got the responsibility. And now we get more and more focus on, as regards to environment, on PFOS, PFAS, and TFA. And then it will uh, be the chemical people working in the environmental administrations that will have the main responsibility. It will uh, be covered by different conventions, different departments, different uh, people. Uh, but uh, when we talk about natural refrigerants, apart from, from ammonia, the, the main uh, governmental bodies with responsibility it will not be the environmental authorities, but it will be, uh, in Norway's case, for safety, it will be the Directorate for Civil Protection that takes care of safety as regards uh, explosions, fires, and so on. And for health, it will be the Institute of Public Health, uh, taking care of health issues. And uh, as regards uh, Working environment, it will be the Norwegian Labor Inspection Authority. So that means actually that probably or surely the regulation will still be relevant also for the natural refrigerants, but the responsibility will slide away from the environmental authorities and to, to other authorities. So what's important then is to to get a smooth transition and to um, take care of the good uh, 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 good uh, institutions and uh, processes we, we have also to and forward this to the, the new uh, responsibility authorities. For example, in um, uh, Norway and in EU we have a system for certification of personnel and businesses that's uh, mainly for HF, uh, HFCs, and it's because of, mainly because of the climate-related issues. That should uh, probably also be um, kept going, but uh, administered probably then by other institutions, as mentioned above here. So um, the systems will probably still be there because of health or 
health or uh, safety concerns, and maybe also because of other uh, more trivial concerns like uh, uh, certification, uh, for example, will uh, be good to have maintain high quality of equipment, uh, and so so it may be in any case good to keep uh, many of these uh, practices in the future. Uh, just uh, by the end, I, I will mention a um, case, uh, some kind of case, uh, just to illustrate that this can be uh, rather complicated and not so straightforward as regards uh, regulation, because uh, there are many things that have to take, take and consider, and, and all points of view have to be considered before the government decide. Uh, what, how to regulate. Uh, this example here is about uh, the uh, use of uh, propane in, in uh, domestic air conditioners. Um, I know that uh, in India you have already started uh, uh, to mass produce and use this equipment and from what I heard it's uh, working very well in, in India and uh, there has been no accidents, uh, big accidents, and so as far as I know, and um, this uh, would probably also work uh, well in Norway. But in Norway, we, we use these uh, heat pumps for heating and not so uh, much for cooling. Uh, we just reverse them, and in Norway, the climate is uh, very much different uh, from here. Uh, today it's about, in many parts of Norway, it's about 15 degrees below zero. Uh, so it's, it's different climate and different con conditions. And um, uh, uh, I must say that at the moment it's allowed to, to use these heat pumps. It, uh, in Norway it's nothing in the regulation that say that you cannot use them, but uh, they, are, um, um, they, are, they are not very widely, very common. And uh, some of the companies say that these heat pumps will not work very well in Norway under cold climate and they will be not be very energy efficient. I don't know if that is true, but anyway, it uh, illustrates that for every consideration as regards refrigerants, there's a lot of different views to, to take account for and uh, the considerations will often be rather complicated based on which gas you're talking about, uh, which small or big equipment charters, uh, even the, as I said now, the, the climate conditions. So probably the regulation in the future will be rather diversified uh, uh, depending on usage and uh, equipment and probably uh, rather uh, complicated. So. Yeah, I think that was uh, my main presentation. So if there are any questions. Yeah. Yeah. What is the harm in uh, uh, releasing ammonia at the end of life slowly. It will come, it, it will, water vapor and all, it will, it will absorb and it will come back. So what is the harm in releasing ammonia at the end of life? Uh, slowly, not all of a sudden so that people shout at us. Slowly. Uh, I am not an ammonia expert, so I, need, I have to take it slow, uh, only briefly. But uh, uh, at least in Norway we have uh, emission uh, accounting uh, for uh, emissions of ammonia to air, and uh, that uh, tells that uh, it's a uh, substance of some concern. Of course, most of, almost all of it comes from agriculture, but we have an emission uh, account on that. And um, uh, but I think maybe it's uh, rather higher emissions that what we are talking about in, in the context of refrigeration. That's possible. And uh, a few years ago, we have an accident in Norway where ammonia was released to water and uh, after a while all the fish in this river uh, was dead. So it, uh, I think it's uh, important to 
take it into consideration, but uh, how strong it should be regulated, that's another question. Maybe uh, it's relatively harmless in, in this context, uh, but it has to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sunil Shek, can oh. we take the question later because some sure. of them have to catch a flight. Oh, yeah, sure. It's four. Is that okay? My excuse is for this, but we are running a little bit behind time. So we'll, we'll let you do that as well. Yeah. Our next speaker, thanks, Dr. Grim. Let's give him a round of applause, please. So the next speaker is, uh, I think many of you would be interested. Okay, he is Mr. Murli Krishnan from CII Hyderabad. And uh, so he's going to talk about opportunities for a pilot project, what industry and what the government is really bringing out if you want to build up demo systems. And we'll also have during the panel discussion from Professor Hafner on about what are the opportunities under ND Plus as well. So please stay back for the panel discussion. But over to you, sir. So good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you, uh, the organizers. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, now I am representing the project called uh, FLCTD, Facility for Low Carbon Technology Deployment. So uh, you all know about UNIDO. UNIDO is an industry wing of uh, UN, uh, working with 170 member states, uh, mainly to promote sustainability and uh, the growth of the industry. And uh, they have a program in India, many programs in India. One of the program is the facility for uh, low carbon technology deployment. Any new uh, innovative technology always uh, faces two challenges. One is uh, there are not many leaders in the uh, country or in the world. There are many followers, but there are only quite number of less number of uh, leaders. So any industry generally is hesitant to implement a new technology. They always always need a case study, and everybody needs somebody to uh, support, uh, partly fund any new innovation or pilot. So this project creates all the uh, uh, all that is needed by a new and innovative technology. We need a platform. We need a end user. We need a market. We need an expert. We need a third party to validate, we need somebody to fund, we need uh, replication potential and recognition by the government. All that are there in this project. So uh, UNIDO is executing the project, uh, CII brings the, uh, the industry members, we get the applications from the innovative technology providers, there is an expert panel comprising academia, industry experts and the end users and all the stakeholders, they evaluate and then shortlist the technologies. And then uh, there are uh, financial institutions who help for replication and then who help for uh, the existence of the company. And then uh, there are uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency is also uh, helping them to recognition, government recognition, and then uh, help them for uh, uh, replicating the technology. So that is why we have uh, uh, so many partners, partners here. So it is an eight year project. The overall objective is to go with uh, 120 innovations as long as 120 innovations. So far we are successful in uh, 60 innovations uh, validating, validating almost 25 plus technology innovations. Out of that uh, 14 are already available as a commercial products and they are uh, uh, scaling up or uh, coming up uh, rapidly. So more than 20 crores of uh, support has been given. It is not a grant, it is actually a, uh, a reimbursement which is the whatever expenses spent for pilot it is getting uh, reinvest and then uh, uh, the program started like uh, the early stage innovation there was an accelerator program which uh, supported uh, the uh, technologies which are in the idea level or in the lab level to get converted into a commercial scale and then there is an innovation challenge we are going to announce the uh, last challenge of this program the sixth challenge which is going to come up in april uh, april and then uh, we also do the financial due diligence and then fundraising and then we help them in commercialization. As I said, uh, validation, we bring in the end users to pilot it and then uh, we, uh, we help them to commercialize. So basically this is for a TRL level 5 or 6 level companies so that uh, they can uh, uh, demonstrate that in the pilot and then uh, we help them for replication. 
and then uh, almost for this new challenge all the verticals will be allowed to participate we have we do have waste heat recovery and thermal efficiency pumps and pumping systems and motors space conditioning where refrigerants will come into picture mainly in terms of uh, uh, the uh, efficiency of the refrigerant per se but uh, this can also come in uh, industrial resource efficiency industrial resource efficiency also and then uh, the electrical energy storage system is there industrial iot is there what is happening also is danfoss is also supporting many of the new innovative companies to uh, accelerate and validate and then implement their their technologies in a much faster rate that is one thing and this program is not only for uh, a startup or a new technology provider even force marshal is part of this they applied for this shakti pumps they applied in this because it gives other than your grant or other than the support for financial it also gives you visibility it also gives you recognition at the national level it also helps you to replicate faster so that is why even a bigger company bigger technology provider they participate and uh, on behalf of unido and the other stakeholders i request all of you whoever is the uh, innovator whoever is the whoever is having incubation center whoever is working with uh, new startups whoever is a big technology provider here having new product applicable for india having a patent or applied for a patent please participate in this program so this is the eligibility and qualifiers are like innovative solutions at the proof proof of concept or early stage prototype clearly indicate the technology gap being addressed and then uh, the emerging and novel technology applications improvement in materials used innovation in overall system design e in energy efficiency or a low carbon and then uh, design improvements it can be of any of these category and then uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, there will be uh, support up to 50000 dollars 35 lakhs for reimbursement of the expenses made for uh, pilot it is not a grant it is uh, more of a reimbursement including your overheads and mandate spent and then uh, when whenever we go to industry as a technology provider we commit many thing the industry may have its own doubt so they always look for a third party validation either from academic academicia or a person who understands the industry so that that role we play ca gbc green business center we play as a third party validation and then we also do that and then uh, de risking of innovations before commercial launch industry linkages financial mentoring and fundraising support these are the supports uh, what flcdd can offer and uh, as i mentioned we have a prof jury panel which is shortlisting with industry experience more than 40 years experts from department science of technology we have bureau of energy you know bureau of energy efficiency representing the government and then uh, experts from technology information forecasting and assessment council all these are part of this expert panel so all the aspects and all the domains are covered so these are few of the technologies of course uh, this is also implemented in big basket uh, distribution center in uh, bangalore so they produce chillness from uh, uh, wood waste or a biomass waste and then uh, uh, by a big, big big basket they had coffee as to be disposed they were not they were finding for a problem and this company this startup company helped them to convert that into maintaining their cold stores the moment they again danfoss supported it and here ammonia water the natural refrigerant is used as a refrigerant uh, refrigerant the moment it got uh, success and they implemented now the company's turnover has gone up a very high level they are winning uh, awards at various international levels they have uh, they are the best example for this project how this project can bring a change so i request you whoever is in bangalore to visit that facility we can arrange facilitate for that visit now big basket in bangalore that particular distribution center itself they have more than 15 installations of the same technology the other thing is these are all uh, a small milk can like this not only improves the sustainability but also improves the uh, the economics of the poor people in the village normally in village every house will have one or two cows okay they will have 10 liters to 20 liters depending upon the season depending upon the hybrid so they have only 5 mil 5 liters of excess milk okay any dairy in india more than 30 only 30% of the milk is collected in an effective way or processed in a uh, better way so what they do generally they consume it or they make sweets or they don't get any money for that 5 liter milk which is there and uh, in the milk so unless you cool it within 1 hour from the time of milking to less than 4 degrees 
you will not be able to maintain the quality you will not be able to maintain the quality of the products which are made out of milk so this system can work like a refrigerator in your own house you can connect it to solar you can cool the milk temperature from 30 degrees to 4 degrees within few minutes and it is also connected with the uh, phase change material as a thermal energy storage so that is another it is successfully used and now it is helping many of the women self help groups to earn additional money which they are able to improve their uh, livelihood and as well as it also increases the improves the quality of the milk and it avoids wastages and it is also implemented this is again another version where in bmcs in bulk milk coolers or in the milk collection centers uh, generally many of them run on dg many of them run for 4 hours 6 hours for cooling the milk again here it can be uh, it's a combination of uh, energy uh, maybe the thermal energy storage and renewable energy can be part of it and then uh, uh, what uh, the fl3d projects also promotes is uh, zero odp and low gwp represents so far and one of the uh, applicant in the recent uh, cycle also has uh, applied for co2 based refrigerant and it is under uh, implementation not this technology so this is again uh, another uh, uh, milk application which can be again adopted at uh, village level so this is uh, another area where uh, the pcm phase change materials are used for uh, transporting the food supply chain like on the way cooling when you transport the product from the agricultural farm to your collection center or the end of end distribution channel or either meat or fish or ice cream any of the food items during transit they help them to maintain the temperature avoid uh, usage of diesel and fossil or fossil fuels and then help them to maintain today people have started using pcm in sachet packets so that the delivery of the medicines and the products which needs lower temperature can be maintained this is also another successful story uh, in under this project so this also has been made into like carry bags so that uh, you don't need to you can even even use it for a lower size and the end of distribution that kind of uh, this thing also has been implemented so so far more than 200 and plus uh, uh, 211 plus client locations spread across the country different sectors have been facilitated uh, 18 large industries uh, 62 msme units 34 dairy units 33 buildings 64 agricultural fields like uh, starting from irrigation, monitoring your water, monitoring the growth of the plant using IOT, the end collection, distribution, the entire aspects have been, uh, uh, have been covered under this project and uh, we are happy to share that they are all successfully running. One of the winner from this project, he has brought in a change of about 35% reduction in energy consumption and now that technology after getting validated is being used by BHL, one of the major uh, technology provider and it has won uh, various awards and again the turnover of the company has gone to very high level after this uh, project. So this is the uh, project goal. We have one more challenge to participate. I request all of you to uh, join this program and then for any further details please visit this website and we will be very happy to connect you with uh, any of the past winners and then we will be very happy to connect you to support you for the application for the upcoming challenge. So before I close, again we are similar to the stage uh, called Gurukshetra War. Okay. So our forefathers or our previous generation knowingly or unknowingly has spoiled the climate. And our future generations are seeing at us what we are doing. Like Pandavas were seen by the other people. They have to re-establish the good things. So that's what in Bhagavad Gita Krishna said, Yatrucha Sobabandam Swargadwara Mamamurdam. So, luckily, we got an opportunity wherein we can change the community from a bad practice to a very good practice. We are at this level. And uh, I tell you, in CII, we have demonstrated what we started with one building in 2003. India today has 10 billion square feet of green building. We also have one advantage being developing country, even today, is we can adopt the latest technology. So, it is now in our hand whether we will save our future generation or we will continue what our fathers and forefathers did. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. So, I know many of you would have questions for him.
So my contact details are there. Uh, yes. With, so Mr. Promoth, yeah. uh, I can take two or three questions. I don't have a problem. Uh, well, I mean, please. we'll break for tea in shortly. So I think uh, let's finish the next two talks and then you can discuss during tea time. He sure. has sure. a hard stop at four. He has to leave. The flight's at six. Yes, sir. Or seven. Yeah. It's 6.50, so 6 o'clock is boring. Yeah. No, you can yeah. reach in 45 sure, sure, minutes. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be there. So maybe a little bit you can join us. Sure, 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 sure. So I'm sorry that you know we're not taking too many questions right now because we have to accommodate the other speakers. So our next speaker would be Mr. Pratik Trini from Alpha Level. Okay. Let's give him a, I mean, let's give Mr. Billy Krishnan a warm applause. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So after lunch, this is third presentation. So I will do my best to engage you. Already two presentations are so much engaging. So I will keep up to that pace. So uh, I will take you through uh, what is alpha level contribution in terms of sustainability field and what we are doing in terms of CO2. Uh, so the before starting to the product, I will show you a small movie and it will give you the brief background where Alpha Level is heading globally and that's what we want to do in India as well. Whether in, in terms of uh, efficiency, in terms of uh, economy, circular economy, clean energy and so on. We are in this together so let's dial up the pace and push on faster no more laters ifs and whens more nows and yes we cans and we focus the brightest light on ourselves we will be carbon neutral by 2030 it will cost a few tears and plenty of sweat but the ultimate alternative is not an option we are in this together, remember? So how can we do what we already do? Even better, even... Let's start from... Start. We are in this... Together. So let's dial up the pace and push on faster. No more laters, ifs and whens. More nows and yes we cans. And we focus the brightest light on ourselves. We will be carbon neutral by 2030. It will cost a few tears and plenty of sweat, but the alternative is not an option. We are in this together, remember? So how can we do what we already do? Even better, even faster, but using even less energy. You see, old has the potential to be the new new. Because our products optimize, because our products minimize, because energy efficiency can help our customers reach their sustainability goals. It turns out whipping cream and climate do have common ground. Make more out of less. That is sustainable food. High speed for slow food, reduce and reuse waste, water and energy. Circularity is key turning costs into profit and waste into value. We can help with that. A so-called win-win-win. Winning win and sunbeam power, we love that. Clean energy for a cleaner world. We think it's time to turn things around. Together we can make the seemingly impossible possible. A circle of friends speeding up the journey towards a more sustainable society. Because after all, we are in this together. Yes. So, any uh, feedback from 
from this slide what we try to tell that we are here together in this workshop and there is no one can say that we will do the change on our own it requires partnership it requires association and that's what we are doing with IIC uh, with uh, uh, NTNU to find out the solution maybe that solution currently not with us some solutions are with us but it is a kind of a partnership approach and a solution analyzing approach then and then we can come to a solution okay this is the message uh, so coming to our main subject sorry so uh, from morning we are hearing about sustainability uh, sustainability buzzword very important and there are lots of information on slides which says that uh, without that we will we will be in big shit to be harsh and because it's a global warming this is something which is very critical and why it is now more uh, important because there are green movement renewables available pace of change is fast as there was a one gentleman was saying that in next two decades our energy demand will be high very high pace so it requires refrigerant change and obviously in uh, refrigerant change the refrigerant is used in air conditioning and refrigeration mainly so the short term we, we see that R32 and then 1234 ZE is currently the option but that is not a long term option legislation and desire this is like uh, umbrella efforts from all sides then and then things will change reducing consumption leads to need for greater efficiency and that's where, where we are currently together how we can find out the solution and how the end users ultimately because the, there are people from biocon and there are certain end customers solution developers if that solution is implemented then and then ultimately the aim is achieved and so uh, refrigerants in terms of commercial natural refrigerants this is the all uh, talk about today ammonia carbon dioxide and propane So, this is the portfolio of what Alpha Lol offers in terms of heat exchanger, especially brace plate heat exchanger, uh, which is mainly used for CO2 refrigeration as well as air conditioning globally. So, you can see we have a complete portfolio in terms of whether it's a heat pump, heating, cooling, air conditioning, even oil coolers, uh, even uh, 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 you can say uh, air dryers. Uh, so this is the portfolio of alpha lol plate heat exchanger. I will not discuss today about other range of heat exchanger which we have like gasketed, semi welded for ammonia as well as spiral compa blocks which are different kind of heat exchangers. But why alpha lol is stick only to a plate type because that is the technology which will be uh, giving the efficiency. Because even we use the CO2 or different refrigerants or even ammonia the refrigerant charge has to be less, less and less and that's where plate technology helping a lot. So, this is the portfolio. So, I will take some time to explain this. As we have seen, uh, what is the difference between CO2 and 134A? As Professor Pramod Kumar has clearly explained, the pressure. We have to take care of pressure. And uh, pressures which are in the range of 140, 130 bar. So we have a complete range of AXP series. You can see the capacity on x-axis and design pressures on y-axis. So small capacities up to 140 bar. And as we go further, uh, we have a bigger size of heat exchangers. Uh, so typically, uh, uh, in terms of uh, 30 TR uh, transcritical CO2 system for Indian Navy, this AXP 112 was installed. And because we are very uh, committed in terms of developing newer and newer products on the natural refrigerants. Uh, shortly, we will have also a large heat exchanger coming in this range also. When it comes to evaporator, a subcritical range, we have a CBXP which is 90 bar and so on. And then for the 60 bar and uh, pressures, we have this range also in this range of capacity. And recently, we have also launched our new product which is uh, evaporator or uh, flood applications. So what we have seen, it is completely copper based heat exchanger because CO2 has uh, nothing to, uh, no issues with copper. But like there are applications in terms of ammonia, CO2, uh, cold storage, cold chain related refrigeration also, where ammonia is an enemy of copper. 
then we have a full stainless steel portfolio as well uh, which takes care of application like ammonia evaporator uh, and also ammonia CO2 cascade condenser and those units are also available up to 140 bar design pressure so this is our full stainless steel portfolio as such this is a small flow diagram uh, one of the application is the trans speaker co2 compressor rack what are can be the positions depends on on varies depends on customer requirements country to country customer to customer but these are the positions where breeze plate heat exchanger are widely used globally so uh, you can see it start with heat rake leaving, uh, so it is ultimately to generate hot water as heating is very important aspect and hot water is very important when you deal with the CO2. Uh, gas cooler, when you don't want hot water, gas cooler will cool the gas which will be fin type air cooler, sub cooler, then there is a evaporator to generate chill water, again sub cooler super heater, a compressor rack, flash de super heater and also the LT MT range this is also again heat reclaimer is possible and then again suppose super heater. What is important to note here uh, is that pressures. So red line what you see it is a very high pressure uh, uh, line so you have to have a heat exchanger suitable for that kind of pressures. So more than 120 bar and then green line is uh, heat exchangers are less than or equal to 90 bar. So, I think I'm, I'm on time, Professor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, last not the least, okay, uh, as alpha level, we are a supplier, manufacturer, innovator for plate type heat exchanger, but these things I want all of you to keep in mind and uh, that why CO2 is very important, why natural refrigerants are very important. Because I think this graph is self explanatory where you can see all propane, CO2, ammonia, which are natural refrigerants, are having very in zero ODP as well as very low GTWB. If you see other refrigerants, you can see here sitting there, even this refrigerants 134A are higher on GWP. So it is time that we should promote. I, I will say that we all should be wherever possible, wherever the application where CO2 can be applied, natural refrigerant can be applied, we should be brand ambassador for natural refrigerants, I will say. So a uh, few more things. Uh, what I want that you should keep this in mind, everybody knows that, but this is just a division. GWP of CO2 is 1. And what about others? It is a range of 500 and 1800 and what uh, Mr. Armin has also explained, there are also other effects, detrimental effects if it is in environment for so long. No flammability and toxicity. Refrigeration capacity approximately 5 times than HFCs. cost approximately 10 times lower than HFCs because CO2 easily available. Compact skin which is known to I think everyone. So uh, this is my last slide and what I want to say uh, if everyone knows today is 10th March and 10th March 1876 if anyone remembers that was the first that was the day when actually a live crystal clear two way voice call was made by uh, Abraham Bell. So let's make 10th March today. Let's take together call that we will promote, we will push a natural refrigerants, we will be the brand as ambassador for CO2 in the market, wherever the applications you find. And we together can do this change. And we are there to help wherever there is a heat exchange requirement. So that is my message. Thank you. So thanks Pratik, we had a very strong message from you. And thanks also for keeping up the time. Yes. We are really, uh, the next speaker is uh, from Israel, uh, Anish uh, Simha. Yeah. So I think we'll. I'm sure you know there are a lot of questions for Alpha Level, but uh, I can just tell you that we have been using their heat exchangers for past eight years, and we have never had a single complaint from. On the performance or anything that they have always exceeded our expectations. So it's not that I'm going to play an LIC agent for alpha level. Natural, right? <laughs> but it has really helped us out. Thanks.
Что тут у вас стоит? Для стендов. Good afternoon. I am now representing Ishre Bangalore or Ishre. So my name is Anish, and uh, I work for Rinac India Limited. It's a Bangalore-based organization, and I'm currently looking after the Center for Excellence and Training at Rinac. Though I have all been representing Ashre Bangalore chapter. Association of Ammonia Federation and also ASHRAE. Now, currently, I am the member of the ASHRAE of CPCC. So, ISHRAE, we have, as we all been discussing today, how to protect our environment. The theme uh, we were again bounced back here was just because of COVID, we couldn't do much of these programs, and currently now. This year is Prithvi, Prithvi, Paryavaran and Parivartan. Okay, I am not, I will not take much time of this. So we have uh, around 50 chapters today uh, in Ishre, and then these are all the representation. So for all those who are not knowing what Ishre is, it's Indian Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning. <coughs> For refrigeration, we do conduct ref cold, and then we have uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, we have our acrex this uh, coming week in Mumbai. So for this particular today's topic, we do have uh, research projects at Ishre, and one such which is concerning today's topic is the design and development of CO2-based secondary loop systems for cold storage application. And Ishre, along with IIT Kharagpur, this uh, initiative has, was started two years before, and this project is going on. So these are our uh, Bangalore chapter activities, where you can see we, we have concentrated on uh, cold stores and on refrigeration and most probably we have also dealt with ammonia as a refrigeration. So Ishra as a society has been promoting the use of natural refrigerants. And today we will be discussing about uh, the guidelines what Ishra would like to lay out or help uh, in using natural refrigerants in India. So we just have prepared a few slides, which now I'm sure this is the fourth or fifth or sixth slide, which you've already been seeing about what are the natural represents. I'm not going to further go into this. So here we have ammonia and carbon dioxide. And uh, this was all discussed, even including hydrocarbon, which are all petroleum-based represents. So now uh, here we have both carbon dioxide and ammonia, which are more predominant natu natural refrigerants, which can be used for a higher capacities, though hydrocarbons are there, but then there's a limitation in the charge currently. So this again, we all have gone through. Uh, natural refrigerants has uh, like lower cost compared to the synthetic refrigerants. And CO2 I am not dwelling in because already you have seen quite a few. But then uh, for India currently, though we have seen within, in the Navy, they have used uh, transcritical, I suppose. But then basically for larger capacity, may be more useful comparatively at the moment and commercially viable. So these are again advantages of uh, ammonia as the refrigerant. 
which probably we have all discussed but then some of the points or uh, you can see like ammonia is 3 to 10 percent more efficient than the other um, synthetic refrigerants and we all seen it has a lower global warming potential and it has the best therm thermodynamical properties as well as the best COPs low priced and maintenance cost is also low low in investment in equipment and construction and it's environmental friendly so some of the disadvantages like it's only regarding material it's not compatible with copper and then of course if there is leak it depends upon the type of leak and uh, to what extent it is it may affect the human working around so these are some of the disadvantages we'll come back to that so this uh, i just wanted to show you uh, ammonia is um, under b12 and uh, the hydrocarbons are i think they are highly flammable and uh, carbon dioxide is it doesn't it's a no, no flame propagation so it may be under group a1 the classifications were already seen so this is an application where currently the natural represent ammonia is being used in our own country um, especially all our dairies milk chilling center curd butter plants cheese plant ice cream paneer processing and storage of fish meats fruits ready to eat all the pizza bases in temperatures pre coolers blast individual quick freezers then we have ice bank tank water and brine chillers flake tube and block ice so it has a very very wide application and this is not new but as we all know ammonia is there since more than 100 years it had just gone off and now again it's come back so in all these places it was there it had not gone back so now then what is that we need to further promote see why is ammonia refrigeration systems preferred by these users these are all the positives of ammonia because it has higher advantage with reference to energy con consumption compared to the synthetic easily available it's natural in nature and environmental friendly it's a favorable has favorable refrigerant properties so handling of leaks is also quite easier uh, in the sense you can sense the smell and now currently the technology is such that it can be the re rectified whereas in synthetic you don't have the smell and we just if not seen the environment is spoiled the entire refrigerant is gone into the environment so that's there then flexibility in design you have can have a common high side and individual low sides so that different circuits can be maintained using the same ammonia refrigeration whereas this is difficult in synthetic refrigerants highly efficient and reliable components are also there in market today and ammonia has been in use as a refrigerant for more than 100 years why ammonia refrigeration is spoken against by some of the solution providers they say it's dangerous to use ammonia leaks are difficult to handle people will run away on sensing ammonia smell and it causes panic to public causes injury serious health implication to operators exposed to ammonia plants then ammonia systems have higher initial first cost need trained operators to run the system products get spoiled when exposed to ammonia refrigerant then it consumes more power so these are some of the uh, marketing tactics or some of the information that people who are not in ammonia business are conveying to the customers so the people in ammonia will always have to fight against this so now <clears throat> this natural refrigerant we have already studied much about uh, means we have so many sessions on co2 and then there were few on uh, the hydrocarbons because it's a petroleum based and we all know that the charge is the limitation factor so what uh, need to be done in india further 
to promote more ammonia is ammonia is a natural okay always about the usage and benefits refrigeration compressor suitable for ammonia refrigeration is not available okay in few places trials are going on and some places they have implemented basically for ammonia some should be made mandatory for cold storages of as after certain refrigeration capacity subsidy power for power to be provided to all ammonia refrigeration systems for a certain window of time that means you start say one time maybe in the month of in 2024 then start giving subsidy for 3 to 4 years to every ammonia based refrigeration plant for power then promote usage of ammonia refrigerants for all products so this is what we need to educate the users and also the we want this these kind of policies to be brought in to be, begin with a positive temperature cold storage of having a capacity of 40 tr and above should be made mandatory to use ammonia as the refrigeration similarly if it's a low temperature testing and prospective cold storages that the cost of storage per metric ton using ammonia is less compared to the cost per metric ton using synthetic refrigerants and that is though initially the synthetic refrigerant costs are low refrigeration system but then if there is a leak because you do both plus and minus when there is a large warehouse you use the typical rack refrigeration wherein you see if the refrigerant leaks then you will have to replace the entire refrigerator then it takes time and then uh, compressors many times will always some one or two will be under repair this is what we get a feedback from the customers who are using ammonia or the rack refrigeration systems then cost of ammonia we all know is quite lower compared to the synthetic refrigerant promote training to the refrigeration system operators continuously and keep validating their certificates this is very important point whereas like our driving license we need to keep validating the licenses for operators then provide star rating to cold storages cold storages using natural refrigerants to have higher star rating in india policy storage system with suitable refrigerant and efficient systems that means if they have an outdated refrigeration system still the owner insists that with whatever i am happy i don't want to do anything so such systems we should ensure that if they are found to be inefficient then we need to bring in guidelines wherein they will have to change the refrigeration system safety is a major concern to the existing cold storages and upcoming cold storage projects policy on safety to be pro propagated and bought, uh, put in force this policy is for installation and maintaining of the ammonia refrigeration plants now why i am using the word ammonia refrigeration because in india's co2 is not commercially so popular where we can immediately find a solution and replace of course wherever co2 can be used ammonia can be replaced i'm not just saying that ammonia means it's only ammonia we're talking about natural refrigerants then we have this maintain the record of the refrigerant charge which i have seen in some of the european countries they do maintain for in every plant in every customer which refrigerant and what the charge they have charged in that so that they will regulate they know how much of uh, refrigerant has leaked into the uh, into the atmosphere and then you can also impose them on the policies and guidelines then accidents prone cold storages to see we have seen uh, uh, that some accidents keep happening the recent one recently it happened in up where the truck driver while reversing or after loading or unloading he has gone and hit a refrigerant pipeline so those are clearly avoidable situations and since he is not aware of the impact he doesn't know what it is so better we um when the policy should bring in a sort of layout wherein we can save and make it mandatory give space yeah so this is implement the uh, proactive precautions 
preventive safety indicator or faulty indicators this are there in most of the systems but then this has to be made mandatory ammonia leakage warning spray system full the safety kit for the operators should be available and it should be usable remote monitoring auto alerts by sms emails improve automation in the sense you have introduced a automation system uh, for ammonia refrigeration so that you will get all the feedback and it's easy for us to service and maintain so this is what i wanted to share uh, wherein we could bring in as a policy uh, for our own country when we are going to start uh, implementing and changing to natural refrigerants which is the aim of today's uh, lecture here so with this i'm just concluding my session you have any questions thank you so much yeah. Paul. i think it was very informative we needed somebody to champion ammonia <laughs> is very good so we will have uh, uh, ms anis uh, now session sir you will be there till the end right yeah yeah okay so then any questions on ammonia particularly certainly he can answer and uh, so it's a mixed bag of things so it looks like ammonia is safe and it's already a represent to go be there i think prasa hafner you also have to advocate for it okay very <laughs> good so then so we have uh, maybe so we have the next speaker is dr dr sunil shah and uh, ajay ajay oh, yeah. so we will we will now after this will break for tea but before that uh, you know my request is let's assemble down in front of the main building for a photograph have a cup of tea and then we'll start the next session but we won't take we won't hold you for long you know it's been a long day in the stand okay thank you Uh, good afternoon everybody my name is uh, sunil shah uh, i am part of a uh, startup called uh, modelicon infotech and along with me is my colleague uh, ajaya and both of us will take you through some of the things that we have been doing on sustainable technologies uh, we have been working you know while the presentations coming up we have been working on sustainable technologies on variety thing a variety of things including looking at uh, co2 capture from air the 400 ppm at Uh, CO2 that we have been talking about in the morning. How do we capture that and use it uh, for sequestration or probably onto refrigeration, etc. Uh, we are also part of uh, the four, you know, consortium members uh, which set up the 30 ton uh, refrigeration along with, uh, you know, IIC, TC, Danfoss, uh, and Modelicon. Uh, and of course, thanks to Indian Navy and IIC for that opportunity, uh, as well as you know the chance to present today. Uh, there are basically three things we wanted to talk about one is uh, while setting up this facility there was a requirement how do we do the performance guarantee so we really you know we set with iic team as well as the other engineering teams and sort of designed uh, the load test facility such that you can look at operating conditions especially the ambient conditions starting from very low temperatures to you know relatively high temperatures like what you would see in india so how would your test facility look like and emulate those conditions uh we been coming from controls background we really you know look deeper into the controls algorithm in fact uh, danfoss is the one who supplied the whole setup uh, but we just wanted to understand what are the control loops so we had a couple of slides on that but because of the time we'll skip that in case you have any discussions on advanced product process control we can talk about it later and we would like to spend quite a bit of time on the last part which is we built our own simulation model of the whole uh, co to control loop and we are now in the process of integrating it as an op operator training simulator we basically work on 
uh, by building virtual reality solutions. And what we do is we integrate, uh, you know, real time or the you know the simulation models with VR so that you can do operator training, etc. So you can actually have a three-way: the simulation model, you can have the control system, as well as you can have the you know the VR and sort of you know give training to the operators as if you know it's uh, it's real life uh, and create extreme situations right so you know it's very difficult to sort of you know uh, create those uh, you know train your operators in situations which are abnormal right so these are the three things ah, sorry my apologies okay so uh, let me very quickly go through the load test facility uh, so the main objective like what i said was you know looking at uh, varying operating conditions and in order to do that, uh, we sort of set up the design. You can go to the next slide. Keeping in mind, we don't want to sort of, you know, uh, you know, unnecessarily put additional equipment as well as from energy conservation point of view. Uh, so, Ajay, you can go ahead. So, we essentially designed it in such a way uh, that the, the, the chilling load itself is sort of, you know, creates the cooling effect, right? So, we created one hot well, one cold well, and the chilling load basically comes into the cold well, and the extra cooler, the extra chilled water goes into the hot well, so it acts like a pseudo cooling tower. Uh, there is, of course, you know, because of the difference in the efficiency, there is still some amount of extra chilling which is required, so we had to put one auxiliary chiller there. And then, of course, we designed the whole control system uh, as well as the piping. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, we set up a makeshift setup uh, initially, and now the final setup is coming up at uh, IIC. Uh, so with this, the advantage is, uh, you know, you can sort of look at varying operating conditions. So, you know, this is what you're seeing as the cooling water inlet outlet temperatures. Uh, these are the chilled water inlet outlet, inlet outlet temperatures, and that's the COP. So as you can see, you know, as the cooling water temperature varies, you know, uh, you know the operator system is operating in a stable form. And just, you know, one of the things that Professor talked about, the Enforce controller, was that... Uh, it optimizes, right? So looking at the ambient conditions, it tries to optimize the cooler temperature or pressure and sort of increase the efficiency. So and that, that's what you see here. So the Danfoss controller actually is working. As soon as the ambient conditions go down, you can see the COP is going up. Right? So that was actually very good to see. And of course, we have been digging deeper into the control, etc. Uh, so but we'll actually skip this. So in case you want to talk a bit more about this, we can talk later. Uh, let's very quickly go to all the control loops and go to the, yeah. So this is, so one of the things that we did was also in the back end, started building the simulation model of the whole setup, right? So, so this, is, this is actually the work that we do is in a language called Modelica, and, uh, and the environment that we use uh, is Open Modelica. So we built a vapor compression simple loop out here. Uh, so we got, uh, you know, the individual models for the evaporator, for the cooler or the condenser, the expansion valve, as well as the control loops. So one by one, we built all the models. We have integrated it. And, it, and it's a dynamic model. So, you know, so basically, you, know, you can start looking at disturbances. You can start looking at transient response, because you want to sort of check it with controls. Right? And <clears throat> I'll skip the refrigeration, this thing. Uh, and those are the control loops that we have put in. Uh, coming to the next slide, next to next slide. Ah, so, so then we have gone to, uh, we are at this moment trying to integrate this model with virtual reality, and I'll ask, uh, request my colleague Ajaya to take over. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so I, uh, as sir told, uh, with these new technologies, we need the people to operate the setups, right? So mainly there, the operator training simulator come into picture where we have to train the uh, operators or the uh, engineers who will maintain the setup. So the traditional way is I have a 2D simulator run on a PC where the, all the setup is simulated and the operator is made to operate it using that simulator. But with the current technology of VR being implemented in the training, uh, we take that advantage and put it here as a VR operated training simulator. So I'll just take, quickly take you through the what the VR operator training simulator contains. So it has three main parts. On the left you see the VR headset or the controller where the operator will be visualizing the main plant and we'll take it through a, uh, we'll take you through the demo of how it will look like in a VR platform and on the center we have the process simulator or the digital twin of the actual plant which we simulated 
which will behave physically and dynamically as same as that of the physical plant. So the whole first principle models and the physical models are implemented in that model. And then on the right side you have the PLC or the control algorithms. So the, all the control sequence, start, uh, shutdown sequence, stop sequences, emergency sequences, all those will be implemented there and the operator will get in hand experience of what should he do in any conditions or any uh, uh, un unforeseen conditions. So that is the main, uh, so these are the three main parts of the VR operator training simulators. So now I'll quickly take you through the uh, VR platform, what we have, uh, what we did for the Indian Navy setup with permission with the, uh, from Indian Navy. We'll, I'll just show you what this setup looks like. One second, uh, let me just. So I'm running the simulation. Uh, right now, this is a only the VR model or the left side what you saw. So the uh, process model is being implemented to this model. So this is the complete VR setup. So this, this, ref this is the refrigeration setup. So refrigeration setup is put in the room and the whole setup you can visualize from all the different angles as if it is an actual setup. You can identify individual models individual, oh, sorry, yeah, individual identify each model, each components, what is this, each gauge. So you can individually train an operator what should be operated at any given point of time, uh, how do you start, how do you stop, and then for a maintenance engineer, what is the each component? So identifying each component, like what, so this is the compressor. So on the top right, you can see the specification of that compressor, how uh, what is that compressor, how much kilowatt it is, what type of compressor it is. So for an uh, operator and maintenance engineer also, it would be helpful for them to identify the component, how what specification it is, what it is, so that this will help even the, uh, in, in certain extent, uh, troubleshooting also. So uh, remote troubleshooting where the operator can see this and identify what is what. So individual instrument level, component level, uh, the model can be visualized and experienced in. So this I'm simulating in a, a Windows or a desktop level. So the, uh, ideally this would be worn on a, the, the operator would wear a VR goggles and he can visualize in front of his eyes the actual setup. So for the demonstration purpose, I'm showing it in a 2D screen here, but actually it would be a 3D screen or 3D uh, goggles what you'll wear. And then through that goggles and a handheld controller or a, a controllers to move in the VR atmosphere, like how I'm doing it in the mouse right now, he'll be doing it through the uh, controllers where he can actually visualize the whole plant. So as I said, uh, this plant right now is of the TCO2 refrigeration what has been implemented. Same thing, the main plant can be replaced by any other plant of the natural refrigerants, any other technologies and can be put into this model to make the VR operating training simulator. That's the main uh, part. Over to you. Thank, thanks, Ajaya. And of course, you know we are at this moment in the process of integrating this with the simulator, uh, so that you can actually do the full operator training simulator. You can open and close the valves manually here, and see what is the impact, etc. Uh, that's it from our side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, we can take them later. Uh, yeah. So, hang on. We have one more last. Session. Okay, one more last speaker. So, one thing I would like to tell you is that uh, Modelicon has been working with us. I mean, we have been, or rather, I would say, we have been working with Modelicon, <laughs> other way around, pardon me. So, we have been working together for the past five years, and many of these things, Ajaya was an intern in our lab as well. So, so I think the VR platform is something that IAC is work, looking forward to with Modelicon for many of our. Uh, pipeline projects that are there. So I think you'll see a lot more of the VR reality that is going to come in there. So, and uh, on the on the control loops, you know, everything was optimized for the project that we did for Indian Navy was with, uh, jointly with IIC and Modelicon. So, so we did get them because the professional level with which we wanted things to be put in on record, what the Navy demanded is something that uh, we didn't have the bandwidth, so I think that certainly filled in the slot. And on the same thing, I would like to also acknowledge that uh, Tata Consulting Engineers was the um, EPC, I would say. EMC. 
PMC. PMC, yes. PMC. Yes. I'm, my mistake, you know, I, I don't understand yes. these things. <laughs> yeah. So, project monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Pro project management consultants. For project management consultants yes. for us on this project. So, it was basically licensing between Indian Institute of Science and the yeah. Indian Navy. So, so this was something that, uh, you know, in the load test facility, uh, what was also what Dr. Sunil Shah showed, and largely the testing standards were established based on what TC had suggested on what should be a qualifying point for the Navy to accept this kit there. So, Chetan, you want to say something or? Let okay. Me? okay, all right. So, my only request to Ravi Prasad, I've known him for some yes. time with your permission, sir, is that yeah. we'd like to keep it a little bit short yeah, if sure, it's possible. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. No, 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 we, it, it is very much required, but I think if anybody wants to look at what the testing standards are for carbon dioxide based systems and how does it compare, then yeah. uh, TC is the, uh, is the contact point for us. Thank you. Yeah. So, hi, I am uh, uh, Ravi Prasad uh, from TC. Uh, so, so, having spoken all about uh, the benefits of carbon dioxide and uh, the natural refrigerants, uh, now finally, you know, we are, we have a critical responsibility of uh, testing it and uh, seeing that how is the behavior, does it uh, behave properly and that is meet the intent uh, with which it is uh, being designed. So, uh, see most of the testing standards, you know, uh, which is already available are being used. Uh, so, the normal, uh, 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 from HRI we have the uh, 550 and uh, 551, 591 or 550, 590, they have a proven uh, test standard for uh, vapor compression refrigeration. I think many in the industry may be knowing. And then we have an Indian standard also, IS 65950 and then uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency is, uh, they also have uh, put forth the requirements. So, all these things were studied and uh, whatever uh, were the rating conditions, so you are able to see from uh, HRI, so it is uh, 12 and 7 is uh, the normal uh, uh, chilled water inlet and outlet conditions at uh, what uh, for water cooled it is 30 and 35 that is the condenser water inlet and uh, outlet conditions so we also have uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah so we have uh, uh, so this, this is the highest standard as per which uh, 12 and so uh, in hri there is a condition exclusively for indian condition so which is uh, 12 and 7 and then the uh, flow rate is mentioned then uh, condenser water inlet temperature and outlet temperature is mentioned. Whereas in IS 6590 also there is a, it is also, it is also a same, a same 30 degree and uh, 5 degree delta which is uh, again matching with this and again uh, this uh, 7 and 5 degree delta which is again matching with uh, uh, 12 and 7. So, what are the datas to be recorded? Those things are also mentioned. Uh, the, so, basically it is to establish uh, how much is the you know, heat being absorbed and then uh, how much is the power uh, that is consumed. So, for that uh, no, there, there is a clear tabulation which is given in HRI and uh, as well as in IS650 what are the parameters to be seen. So, it is basically the flow rates and the entering and leaving water temperature and uh, on the condenser side it is again the entering and leaving water temperature and then the water flow rate. So, sometimes you know the, the chiller manufacturer you now he will have to uh, uh, give a uh, uh, commitment on how much is the pressure drop across the system. So, that also is monitored. So, and then uh, uh, okay, the on the refrigerant sites uh, we have uh, not uh, monitored much. So, the final uh, these things are uh, the calculated uh, capacity and then the calculated efficiency okay and uh, the pressure drops were also seen. Yeah, the permissible variations uh, as per IS 6590, uh, we were, uh, no, uh, we did not follow uh, this uh, very stringent requirement, uh, uh, maybe a bit uh, relaxed uh, requirements, but uh, all these, you know, uh, uh, variations were, uh, you know, seen and uh, yeah, the tolerance uh, definitions are also given in HRI and as well as IS uh, 16590. So, the HRI lock sheet, uh, this is a standard. Uh, HRI uh, lock sheet you know, for uh, various uh, entering chilled water temperature and uh, the various condenser water temperature. The same format was used and uh, we have uh, tabulated for a, uh, for a, uh, uh, for a 7.2 degree Celsius uh, what and various uh, condenser water entering temperature. So, this is the test facility. Uh, so, so, I think uh, as model econ team as uh, no, uh, they have uh, explained. So, there were uh, the chiller was connected to uh, a hot well and cold well. By mixing of uh, the hot and cold well, we were able to uh, so simulate air temperature. Just interrupt. Yes. So, I think the slight courtesy is from uh, Triveni Turbine. So, we yes. have Mr. Purva yeah. who is representing Triveni Turbines here. So, this entire thing, you see the clean shop floor. 
I think it is, it is not any edited image, it's as clean. So yes. if you visit to any turbines, yeah. it's as clean as this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So nice. So we had an auxiliary chiller. So in case, you know, yeah, it is, so see, it is a water cooled, uh, you know, chiller, 30 tons, 100 kilowatt. So this was tested as per HRA conditions. And then uh, the test facility was, uh, you know, this, whatever you are seeing is the test facility. So what uh, model econ team has explained. So there was a hot well and cold well to, you know, to ensure that uh, the uh, different condenser water entering temperatures. What is the, um, you know, how does the system behave? Uh, it is a gas cooler rather actually. On the, after the gas cooler, there was a heat exchanger. So, uh, so there were two, two levels of heat exchange. It was not directly a condenser. So basically I think uh, we, you would have noted the difference, uh, you know, in a carbon dioxide cycle, they call it as a gas cooler because it is a gas phase. It is not actually condensing doesn't happen here. Yeah, it's a gas phase. So, and then we had an auxiliary chiller also air cooled to in case we had to, you know, go for a low temperatures, then, uh, you know, we, and uh, uh, so we were able to simulate it using a uh, uh, chiller. So what you are seeing on the right side, I think, you know, this was in a, a place where uh, our model con team were sitting and uh, they were controlling the test. Uh, so, I think hope it's clear. Yeah, this is the testing condition what we have seen at uh, water inlet temperature and outlet temperature and uh, 7.2 and 12.2 with uh, 32 and 37 degrees. This is the, yeah, that's what, see there was an in between heat exchanger I was saying, no, water to water heat exchanger, okay, and then uh, evaporator. So these three levels of, uh, uh, three heat exchangers are used. So this is the test results, what we have seen. See all that, you know, uh, whatever, you know, we were uh, able to see in a normal chiller. So all these things were happening and uh, all this were you know, controlled by the AKPC controller. We were able to find as the cooling water temperature was uh, reducing, we were able to get a, a better COP and uh, you know, uh, I will show you one more slide, last slide, yeah. So this uh, slide is, you know, we, the target was up, up to 100 kilowatt. We have ensured that, you know, the uh, 100 kilowatt is met at uh, the conditions and even it's a stringent condition. See, it was at 7 degrees. Uh, now we are at 6.7 also. It was more than 101 kilowatt. And that to at uh, 33 and uh, 30 uh, something. Uh, and 11.9. We have not even, uh, you know, reached 12. So even with less. So that means, you know, the uh, skid has delivered a capacity more than uh, what is required. So the intent of uh, was met. That's what uh, we wanted to tell. Yeah, that's uh, fine. So that's about, uh, so now ha having spoken, I think uh, we have uh, uh, ensured that uh, the skid is uh, meeting uh, uh, the required uh, test requirements and uh, it was proven. And uh, we have even measured the power consumption and all those things. So that data is also there. So, you know, the, as we said, I think the cycle performance has to be improved. Uh, maybe with, uh, this is again, uh, we were saying it is uh, without a, uh, um, uh, what is the ejector? So it is a simple cycle. So that's why the uh, COPs are a uh, bit lesser. Maybe the ejector model, the COP would have been better. Yeah, I think uh, any questions? I think with the server. It's uh, see the power consumption per ton is uh, slightly around 15 percent higher when compared to this. Uh, see, it is 15 uh, percent higher than a normal uh, single star rated uh, chiller. If you see Bureau of Energy Efficiency, single star rated uh, chiller is about, uh, I think, 0.7 kilowatt per ton. This is about 0.85. So as the you know technology advances, and you know uh, there is a lot of research, the cycle performance improvements, I think we'll be able to uh, you know achieve uh, better and better COPs. So this was during measured during the run-in time. Yes. Okay. okay. So I think Navy now has got better performance than this. There, it is comparable to their 134 ray system. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, so it is, okay, so. Um, then one more, it is actually there, are, we were having two, two heat exchangers. So there is again a you know, delta loss. Yes, of, so we so have two internal heat yes. exchangers because we wanted to protect the system and have a clean yeah. circulation system inside. So it was slightly over designed to ensure that we are protected and maybe wanted more robustness compared to the performance thing. That was a main requirement also from them. So thank you very much. So I think I would like to, you know, there were, there were two more speakers, but since both of them have been my former students, so Dr. Pradeep Gupta and Dr. Kundan Kumar, I think if you may. So I would like to at least you guys, uh, all of you have been great audience, if you can give them a round of applause. <laughs>
for a reason that I have requested them saying that, well, can we do it next time? And both of them have smilingly agreed so that we can now keep in time for the panel discussion and other things there. So at least uh, for their hard work on the presentation that they have put in there, certainly they deserve another round of applause for <laughs> So, sorry, sir. Yeah. So, so I, I think I, yeah, and also they have been, and I think also, sorry, I have missed out. And uh, we would like the entire postdoc team from Indy Plus and researchers to be, please come on stage. It's not the concluding thing there, so please don't go away. <laughs> We're going to have tea in the panel discussion, but I think we know. Can you come, please? So the entire management shiva. Arun is not there. Yeah, the entire Indy team. Yeah. Sarun, please come. I don't think you need an invitation. Please come. So I think we'd just like to get the Indy Plus team. So Yeah, please. Please just come. Okay, they want us to come on the stage, it seems. So I think uh, we. Um, I would I would let uh, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're the senior most amongst us, so you should do the honors about the English team. HD for beauty. No, no, no. Just say you're the English best team and what is the work that you've been doing. So I think that was what was supposed to be presented. Good afternoon. This Indie Plus project is. I can help you also. It's a continuation of Indie. After. Oh, don't be shy. On stage. After then successfully completing Indy project, uh, we got Indy Plus. It is an extended project in the sense of a consortium. We have got uh, four uh, institutes from India, and uh, did by then uh, NTNU, and of course in, from India. And we have Sintef from yes, Norway, Sintef. and we have yes. NIA, which is the yeah. environmental agency, yeah. and we have IAR from the International Institute of Arbitration as a partner too. And CEW? And CEW, of course. Yeah. Yes. So, so this. Uh, so <coughs> the aim is the aim is we started with this. Some of you may have visited IIT Madras, seeing the red uh, the red uh, container with the CO2 system, which was made in Europe and brought here as an example to start the training. But in the second phase, we want to implement systems in real life. That's why we are struggling in the last uh, months and years to find courage uh, and users which want to have a CO2 system, which have the courage to put them in the real production line. And we have found some of them and now we are working hard to get these systems into a hotel, into hotels, in a production line in Kochi. We have one at the, at the Akshaya Patra Foundation kitchen now, which is coming, which is finally delivered. So. It's coming now. And then you have hands-on experience. We will use all this equipment to help you to understand the behavior of the CO2 system. Not all, all of you can go to the battleship. Uh, it's much easier to go into a hotel or into a school kitchen to, to highlight it. But it shows the variety where we can use this kind of system. And it's so flexible. And when we do a good job together, find the right design, dimension it correctly, we can outperform whatever you want. And the remaining systems are made with R290, with ammonia or water or air. And if somebody is not finding a natural working fluid, please come to me, I will help you. Yeah, if you have still an application where you are not finding a natural working fluid, ask all of us. And if, if we cannot help you, you're free to use the other stuff, but I, I doubt that you will have an, any excuse later on not to go into the natural working fluid. And that's why we call it clean refrigeration. And 
There is dirty refrigeration. I showed you this morning what is dirty refrigeration. And there is clean refrigeration. And this is much easier to understand because everybody is painting the bottles green. Huh? Have you seen another color on this HFC systems than green? They are all green. Not at all. So that's why we call it clean. They are not clean at all. And they, can, they will never claim that they are clean. Okay. So let's do clean refrigeration together. We are here to help you and we are happy to have this funding from the Norwegian Ministry of uh, Foreign, Affairs. Foreign Affairs. We will meet them on Monday. We need to convince them that we do a good job so they continue and give us funding. We hope we, I think we can do it. Yes. yes, thanks for coming also today. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Professor Kung, thanks for arranging all this and most honor to Pradeep. <laughs> and the team, of course, of course. Uh, this seminar is on the August uh, thing of uh, Spark project. We yeah. also have got Spark project. IIT Madras, IAC, and ITNU. It is funded by MHRD, but unfortunately, it has not uh, progressed well because, uh, you know, from Professor Harvin and his school couldn't come for months. So, yeah, and it may be partially because of COVID. Yeah, it was COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, we could do two workshops and uh, a couple of uh, uh, meetings. Right? So, whatever possible we could do. And so, we really appreciate the MHRD. Uh, for uh, sponsoring the, the these two workshops. Okay. So we will, we will now break for a photo session and then come back. So incentive to come back is we have Dr. Ragnath Reddy from DST who will talk about the initiatives that he has in pipeline for projects that specifically will involve probably national represent. So I think uh, Mr. Purva you had questions. So if you want to hear the answers and things like that, you know, and then also we'll have some, maybe the Navy can just give us a little bit of the experience towards the end. But I will, I'll promise you that we'll have a hard stop at 5 o'clock. So all of you can <laughs> certainly leave by 5. But let's have a photo session. And then we have, also we have Professor Srinivas Murthy, who has been a veteran, five decades of experience in uh, refrigeration industry from India. So basically, he's also been a faculty at IIT Madras. He's now with IAC, so he will, he, we are honored to have him in the panel discussion. So he will certainly relay his experiences and also he's been associated with uh, the, uh, what was the India cooling, uh, yeah, India cooling price, right? A global cooling price. So his own experiences, certainly he can relay on that. So let's break for, of course, I'm sorry, we have Professor Arakiri also who is the Editor-in-Chief for Sadhana, so the Mechanical Engineering Division. So we have also acknowledged the sponsorship from Sadhana for covering this entire event in, in terms of the video coverage and everything. Thanks to, thanks to you, sir. Very good photography and we have been, and everything, everybody says that, well, it's been very well done. So people who are watching on YouTube, um, you know, have said that this event has been pretty good. So please do come back. This is not the closing remark, it's just for going for a cup of tea and then we'll come back. Okay, thank you.
So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So we have 10 minutes, but I think we might, the clock is running a little bit fast, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so it's running ahead of its time. So it's so something that you need to worry about. Okay. So we have, uh, I mean, all of these people are eminent, so I'm not going to give an introduction to them, but I think in the interest of time, we will actually open up, uh, we'll begin with, the senior most faculty we have is Professor Srinivas Murthy. He will just open the discussion for a panel discussion and then we'll throw it open to the audience. I know many of you had questions. So, uh, specifically, we, Dr. Raghunath Reddy from DST will talk about uh, most of them, I think probably all of you, they have been speakers. So, let me just introduce Dr. Raghunath Reddy from DST. Then, Christoph is from Sintef. Sintef. And and of course, Dr. Sunil Shah, you know, I think others, Armin doesn't need any introduction. So, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's get started. So I think let's have some opening remarks from you, sir. Yeah. The opening batsman. He said senior most, I am the oldest. Uh, may not be senior most, but oldest certainly. So, good evening. And uh, yeah, panel discussion. I mean, uh, all the technical, most of it have been covered uh, so far, and many questions have also been asked. So uh, we need not too much stick to technicalities. Uh, but one thing, possibly, that was mixed, uh, missed was the hydrocarbon, to some extent, even though they are mentioned, and hydrocarbon mixtures. Because this, I know that this is a carbon dioxide heavy uh, group. I can't say carbon dioxide mafia, but certainly <laughs> carbon dioxide uh, is the main thing here. What I want to, of course, uh, there are hydrocarbon mixtures. And then carbon dioxide hydrocarbon mixtures are hydrocarbon carbon dioxide mixtures, depending upon which is heavy, I mean, which is more. Because the best properties of hydrocarbons are taken, but to cap it up with uh, the properties of carbon dioxide. And uh, to a large extent, the so-called high pressure of operation of carbon dioxide to be uh, kind of uh, moderated with uh, hydrocarbons. But to a large extent, uh, hydrocarbons were there. One thing I want to tell, which some people may not be very happy with, is that similar things happened about 30 years ago, in the late 80s, that uh, when the material protocol came and then uh, global warming potential and then it was you know, the low key, but the ozone depletion was the main thing. And then CFCs were the main things for the villains to be replaced. At that time, I was in my prime, I should say, 30, 40 years ago. So we had a lot of uh, discussions, meetings, and workshops like this for uh, uh, natural refrigerants. And at that time, these similar things, of course, now the technology has certainly gone further compared to those days. But still, all the properties of natural refrigerants were priced, and then we were telling, and then everybody was telling. And then I also have attended uh, one IAR conference where uh, the Honorable Gustav Lorenzo, the grandfather of carbon dioxide, uh, you know, 
promoting it, promoting it. So there and then from promoting it, etc. But still, where is natural exposure? They are not there, 30 years ago. And the after 30 years, we are still talking about them, almost like that, with the slightly advanced technologies. And then uh, certainly I do agree there are some individual uh, equipments have been built. They have been put in our demonstration at various places. But many of them are uh, supported by, uh, you know, agencies, uh, governmental or other agencies. But in the market as a commercial thing, it is still not thrived very much. So that is a very important thing because we have to certainly face the reality uh, in the world <coughs> rather than, of course, we are all technical people, researchers, etc., etc. But on the ground, it is the whether it sells is a question. And second thing is most of these things, uh, natural refrigerants could have been very good for uh, unitary systems, refrigerators, you know, bottle coolers and small systems, etc. Where actually, in fact, I still have a, I, I am very proud to say that I have a uh, hydrocarbon uh, refrigerator in my house, which is more than 25 years old, well maintained, very old, like me, very old, well maintained, like that. It is also safe, good efficiency. And I have never told my wife that it has got hydrocarbon because then she will get scared. But I, actually, it's a very safe thing. So they came in those days, got rich, put it in the market. But now today, you again go to the market. You don't get them. You get only 134A and other things, etc. So that's India. That's it? No, no. After that, no, you, can, you will have time. Because I am going to say certain things which I know that he will suddenly uh, this thing and then because we have to take the realities into this thing. And when you try to sell something, uh, a lot of refrigerators and air conditioning unitary systems, they add up to a lot lot of them. As somebody mentioned, I was one of the evaluators for global cooling price, this thing. We did not get a single uh, natural refrigerant uh, in the competition-based system. Everybody was trying to make it with the two, four, five. This and that and everything. So we have to make sure that natural refrigerants reaches the common man and then accepted and then not looked at, uh, you know, uh, doubtfully <coughs> uh, is a thing because then it will spread a lot because of the smaller capacity system. But to the very large capacity systems, I don't know how they think. Certainly, a lot of things have happened in carbon dioxide because of the uh, better knowledge of the properties and better manufacturing facilities and various controls and various things and compressors, etc., etc., etc. So therefore, certainly, there is a very positive thing that is going on. But I want to start with the question myself that why, after 30 years, we are still <coughs> talking about trying to promote natural and then I think Okay, so that gives us a lot of discussion. It's like this nine o'clock debate from from yes. times now. I, so yeah. I, I try to make it short. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice wrap up. However, I would just bring some facts on how many units are globally available. For example, in Japan, there are close to six million CO2 heat pumps producing hot water <coughs> in Japanese homes. They have been introduced about 15 years ago a nice successful market introduction and a, a big market penetration. In Europe, all fridges like you talk about are, are 608 isobutane in Europe. And after the Kyo uh, Kyoto Protocol, the global bottle makers agreed to phase out all HFCs. So all of these bottle vend vending machines globally by Pepsi, by uh, Coca-Cola, by Unilever, and we're talking millions of units are using only hydrocarbons. Some are doing CO2, not many. We have, uh, this company has made 20,000 supermarket, big supermarket systems uh, nowadays, and they are competitors. 
this year we will reach about 100,000 transcritical CO2 supermarket systems globally. So I think we are on a good path. I'm not saying we are ready. It is we are on a good way. You can buy cereal production cars with CO2 air conditioning and heat pumping. So we are, we are in the move. And all of the car manufacturers are seriously thinking about this direction because the PFAS, <coughs> the PFAS restriction is taking, <coughs> taking the plug. Uh, and this is the fact. So that was my comment. Please, if you have any questions, please. So let's take some questions from the audience. I think there was something on funding, so I, Ravi Prasad, can we, if it's okay, you know, we know you, so I will give you an opportunity maybe towards the end. Let's see somebody who has, who? Yeah, yeah, so, so essentially, I think a preempted question, there are two things that we had come prepared, so I should at least, for the work that we have put in, I will ask two questions on your behalf. So. First question is, I think it's in the interest of all of you. Um, DST does a lot of projects under the mission innovation part of it. So I think Mr. Purva had a question in the morning. So can we, with the permission from other panelists, can he get a lead and then you can throw some light on what the immediate opportunities are in terms of what you intend to do in the coming financial year. So by the way, you know, our financial year ends on unlike most of the Western countries on 31st March. So basically, this is the right time for some new proposals. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, <coughs> rather, than, uh, rather than informing what I would be doing, first I think I'll inform what, we, uh, what DST has been doing in this uh, area. Okay. Uh, uh, as a DST as a funding agency we, is mandated with research and uh, research development and demonstration work. And then, uh, re, uh, DST has been uh, funding, has embarked on several flagship programs uh, to support uh, pro programs in uh, energy cooling technologies. And uh, so there are, uh, it, it encompasses all the areas. One is basic R&D, second is human capacity building, uh, third is international collaborations, and then and the fourth one is technology development also. Under uh, basic R&D, there, there were several programs, several uh, individual projects have been funded, <coughs> and then uh, under the mission innovation, India is also active participant in mission innovation and a founding member. Uh, under one of the challenges, affordable uh, heating and cooling, there was a global uh, cooling challenge. Uh, I think it was already mentioned uh, regarding this. And uh, this global uh, uh, cooling price, I think I need not uh, say much. Most, most, uh, most of you must be already aware of it. Uh, this was an initiative jointly by DST, Ministry of Environment, and uh, Ministry of Power to come up with a technology that is five times efficient and which is not costing uh, more than twice the cost today, and <coughs> primarily to address the eating challenges of countries like India and which will cater to uh, other countries globally next. This was one. Other than this, and uh, one project was also given uh, to IACT, Hyderabad, for uh, development of HFO. And uh, I think uh, they have come up with a proof of concept now. Uh, this is uh, basic r &D. Apart from this, under human capacity building, DST has been supporting one uh, fellowship where some researchers and students can visit uh, countries like US uh, where they can get trained, exposed to advanced uh, uh, research there and then come back. And ap apart from this, in the, uh, DSA has some programs on uh, habitat uh, center, uh, habitat uh, effici energy efficiency. And then it had some program with the UK as well as US also on uh, building energy efficiency. No, I had a very specific question is, uh, do you have some industry academia call that you foresee in the yeah. near future for, yeah. can you shed some yeah. light on the funding yeah. and... Adding to that, yeah. uh, so uh, coming to technology, what I want to uh, say is that, uh, 
uh, see in our country, uh, I have been attending all the, I mean, uh, the stake, uh, stakeholders awareness campaigns for phasing out of HCFCs, of, um, uh, conducted by Ministry of Environment and Forest Science. Uh, after attending all those, and I see uh, there is a lot of expertise that is available with our industry, uh, academia, R&D institutions, and then even uh, some industry associations. And uh, so, and there are specific aspects of, uh, which are there. I think uh, if we collaborate and leverage, <coughs> identify, leverage them, I think it will be a very good idea. And uh, DST, whenever there is any R&D challenge, uh, R&D challenge which is there, uh, we, we will readily step in. Uh, we are here to support R&D and technology demonstration part also. This is what I would like to say. Yeah, and probably you can take his email address. There, there are timely calls for DST proposals. And uh, I think there is something that in the pipeline where you have industry academia partnership where for a demonstration. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, since uh, this has been on Koli, uh, after this, maybe uh, we are getting inputs from all the uh, some of the stakeholders. Uh, I am just thinking uh, we will uh, quickly, I mean, uh, draft one call and we'll help, we may try to come out with uh, a specific call for this uh, particular challenge okay. to address this challenge. And uh, this, uh, this will be more or less in uh, technology development. Maybe may, basically it may start from proof of concept and the technology development and technology demonstration level sort of projects. I will request and urge industries and academia and other R&D laboratories to come together, form consortium, and then uh, be prepared for, I mean, applying for that. Yeah, so, so just to add to that, <coughs> excuse me, so you don't have to, you know, come to us. You can go to any education institute in India that you are comfortable with and you believe that together you can develop a technology. It need not be IAC alone. Okay, so I think we don't want to send a message that you have to come to us. It's open to all institutions in India. So I think continuing on that funding, so let, you know, coming back again to it, if there are any questions, it's the last opportunity. I mean, one more will come after some time. Any questions from anyone? Please go ahead. So as I was mentioning in the initial stage in the morning, that the initial uh, investment is quite on a higher side. So is there, and, and we have to compete with the, you know, the HFC based heat pumps or whatever, where the cost is quite low. So what kind of support we can expect from DST? Is there any funding or anything which is possible just to bring us at least to at par with the other, you know, competitors or something like that? So how we can expect and if yes, what is the procedure to, uh, you know, take it forward this discussion? Okay. Uh, uh, at present, what is the TRL level of your technology? Uh, I believe we, we are somewhere at uh, uh, five or six, some, something like that, you can say. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, okay. Uh, now again, I would like to add one more thing. Under the mission innovation, now the mission innovation 2 is going on. Uh, I think you must be aware. Uh, there, even there, there is a lot of scope and to demonstrate. And uh, if it is already at TRL 5, I think uh, getting it, you may get in contact, uh, I mean, contact with uh, any of the academic institutions which you have identified as a partner, since uh, they, uh, DST cannot directly fund you. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is that, so in that case, will uh, uh, what is the contribution from industry? I mean, I think uh, we, we just want to know a process and procedure. Okay. Uh, and specifics we can discuss later on. So, so Apura, I think the question is a little bit more specific yeah, to yeah. a particular thing. Maybe we should take it off the yeah. line. So if there are yeah. any other questions in this context, we'll continue on the funding again. Yeah, Krishna. Yeah, uh, you want to finish? You can finish. Uh, Pramodji, I, I have one, one, one more question, though not to uh, DST, mm -hmm. uh, since I was having this mic. Yeah, sure, that. go ahead. So I was asking in the morning, um, I believe, uh, Mr. to Mr. Sonal, and uh, the same question I was having a word with the other gentleman. Sorry, I forgot your name, sir. I mean, Anish Sinha, uh, yeah. Simha. Sim, uh, so yeah. the question is, we are working on this transcritical CO2, which is a very high pressure, uh, you know, devices. <coughs> So, so far we don't have, you know, any know-hows in terms of the safety precautions, protocols, which is to be followed, or is there, government is thinking of coming out with some protocols that they are going to certify the product, which can be sold to someone, that, uh, from, just from safety aspect point of view. 
so so far it is all we are working based on whatever you know we know and with the industry partner and also with the support of isc but i i feel and believe there has to be some protocols to follow it's a it's a high pressure devices so from just from safety aspect point of view is there anything which can be shared with the industry anybody from the forum would like to answer yeah so you can give yeah but just to answer your question there is a website called r744.com it gives you in great detail all of this information well established information but anyway i think add, add it to it if anybody wants to answer yeah, uh, they can i just would like to add to what you have been discussing it's a valid point what you have mentioned the <coughs> data is available on internet so the problem is practically a person has to be informed ma he should know what he is going to do so more than um, training the or uh, uh, my thing is the person who is going to install irrespective of which organization he belongs to the installer and the person who is going to maintain or commission the system they have to be trained irrespective of the industry in which they are working or maybe a competitor xyz so only those people who are uh, valid to install these systems then you will have better uh, more safe precautionary methods being taken to and then it will address your problem that way we will have to have the guidelines so <coughs> Yeah, he's yeah. So adding to adding to uh, you know his point see globally we are already installing these systems so we can give a you know uh, take a reference from global platform and then we can support you especially with respect to the safety protocol yeah, yeah see when they are he is mentioning globally in india we are now discussing about our tropical climatic condition and we want to do it in india so let's start with these uh, this kind of systems so i think uh, next this talk also to answer that from the norwegian or the european perspective on safety but after you so so i'll answer uh, two questions one is on the funding there is one one uh, thought process that i have as far as safety standards go from a bis point of view we do not have a safety standard on co2 in india as yet that's that's what it is but there are global standards that are available which we can follow and we have already discussed this with bis and today unfortunately they could not be here but we have already had a couple of meetings with them on understanding how do we take this forward to have a standard specifically for co2 in india so that that discussion is on but till the time that is not there we follow the global standards that's yeah. that's what christoph you have anything else to add to that no it's hard to add anything to that okay the second part is on the funding where obviously uh, dr reddy gave some views but my i have a different take on this is that when you look at refrigeration in india and cold chain in india there is already a lot of funding in it and funding comes from multiple agencies it comes from nhp it comes from mofpi it comes from fisheries it comes from a lot of state departments and there are multiple departments who are all funding the refrigeration in india questions but there is no mandate by any agency to look at that this refrigeration that the government is funding has to be sustainable and my request i mean right now dr reddy you are the one who are representing the government so my request would be to you <laughs> is that how can we kind of get this you know because when i look at it from the government you are doing some work be done on energy efficiency pis does on standards and i have named about 5 6 agencies which also do funding and there is no one agency who is directing all of this because if it is the ozone cell then the ozone cell should give a directive under the india cooling action plan that if it is after a particular tonnage and above it has to be a sustainable refrigerant with with particular gwp or particular odp something i mean they can define it they need not necessarily define it as a co2 or something it can be open that will help the existing funds flow in in the right direction according to me rather than start looking for new funds thank you very much very good point 
in Europe, there are communities. They do specification on their equipment they purchase. And then they say, we do only, we want only natural working fluids. So this is already happening now. Also some governmental agencies, when they give public uh, contracts to build something or something like that, it is stating natural working fluids. It's so easy and so simple. Any, <coughs> you had a question? Uh, just a small point to answer. Uh, see this uh, regarding uh, the comparing the carbon dioxide ref natural refrigerants with respect to the other refrigerants. So, you know, it has to be done on a total equivalent global warming. That's what some people do. But when they do that, they take care of the indirect emissions. So maybe, you know, in India now, uh, most of the emissions is coming because of the fossil fuels. Maybe when we run into a situation where the pro electricity production is because of renewable energy, we may land up in a situation where uh, the total equivalent carbon dioxide emission may be lesser. So that is uh, one thing. And uh, yeah, and then uh, this government funding when we are saying, see there are, you know, uh, when an equipment is being sourced, no, there are provisions, I think, even we, when we source it from certain countries, you know, there are uh, the duty exemptions are there. Whereas uh, when we source it from a different country, there are duties. I think those things can be thought over. Now, when we use a natural refrigerant, maybe these exemptions can be given. At least the duty, duty exemptions may not be uh, the uh, price implication. And uh, one more thing, as any technology, uh, maybe you know, when we compare with, with a solar uh, plant, I think 50, 10 years back we were also talking, a you know, solar plant was a very you know imaginary thing. The initial cost was very high, the, uh, and then the cost of power also was very high. Today the situation is different. See, today the you know uh, the cost of the solar plant has come down, and even the uh, price of the power also has come down. So maybe you know going forward, when you know uh, when we take these little steps, you know the co the initial cost as well as the running cost of a CO2 system may come down. So that's uh, yeah. There's another question. So I think there are two. Yeah. So my request to the audience is just keep a small, brief, crisp question, yeah. you know, so that it, we a, can accommodate more. Yeah. It's a very brief question. During uh, CFC phase out, this is question to CEW, um, there used to be uh, numerous meetings from the Ministry of Environment, Ozone Cell, to guide the industry what should be the right direction or getting the technology from outside. The why. Uh, when we are talking green reference in the country, I am not seeing the, now the GWP phase out, what we are talking, there is a movement either from the ministry or the government, uh, what should be the direction for the industry, uh, is that happening? Because some things have to be driven by policies, government push. So, uh, because uh, every industry they are following either from the uh, east side or from the west side. We are in the middle. So we conveniently take from either of that, either of these sides, right? So what's happening on the government? Yeah, anybody has an answer? Yeah, please. He's from Train Technologies. Hello. So in terms of uh, government's engagement with industry uh, in regard to uh, uh, phase out plans, so earlier it used to be there as you also mentioned. Uh, nowadays, uh, government has just started uh, developing their strategy for HFC phase out. So till now they were uh, in, uh, implementing HCFC phase out. So and in this uh, strategy development, they have involved uh, all the industry associations. So. Uh, there is a notice on the ozone cell website also where they have involved uh, Rama, uh, RAS, uh, CII, and uh, RIGMA, Refrigerant Manufacturer Association, uh, SIAM, Society of uh, Indian Automobile Manufacturers Association, uh, Foam Manufacturers Association. So there are seven eight uh, associations with whom they have now involved with, and uh, with their involvement, they are now uh, organizing around more than 30 workshops across the country. So. Today afternoon there is a workshop organized by CIA in that regard. So in a sense they are uh, involving and engaging but still they are in the stage of uh, developing a strategy. 
So and then uh, there will be another phase where uh, once the strategy will be developed, so it will go for consultations, and then once it start implementing, so then there will be a lot of uh, implementing support and hand holding on uh, what are the alternatives and how to go about it. So I think uh, this is what I can comment on uh, uh, with little bit of involvement in this process. So this is how it is happening. Uh, I will. I have also a small comment on the funding issues and uh, the remarks like. Uh, there are a lot of ministries like food processing, horticulture, agriculture, fisheries. So they are putting money or subsidizing the refrigeration part and their prime objective is to basically enhance the productivity and uh, earning capacity of the uh, uh, these communities involved in uh, those activities, either uh, food or agriculture or dairy. Uh, in the past, I was a little bit involved with uh, some of the state governments who were providing subsidies to cold chains and all. And uh, uh, so their objective is also to, uh, in their no, uh, sorry policy, so they means they they cannot mention uh, those kind of technologies for which there are only one or two supplier or even that is not present in that particular state because it uh, they also do not want to be seen as. Uh, promoting one particular company who is, so if there is one or two supplier of that, so they do not also want to be seen standing uh, behind them. So that is also one of the reasons. So uh, uh, for these kind of subsidies to be available for uh, uh, greener cooling solutions, so there should be a certain maturity level of those technologies and there should be uh, a certain level of, uh, certain numbers of uh, suppliers for that. So I think that is also one of the reasons why some of these uh, CO2-based systems, so uh, they are not directly being mentioned in the subsidy programs. Thank yeah, thank you. So I think my request to the panelists and my people is just to keep it short and crisp, the question. So I think, uh, yeah, we have another question. Hi, uh, I would like to, myself, Nitan Tarani. I am from ICAL Systems. We do CO2 heat pumps. My question was to uh, Professor Hoffman that as in Europe, you now CO2 systems have been there for many decades. What is the future in next five to 10 years you see, which is in R&D, which would come in commercial sector in next five to 10 years, in terms of temperatures that it would be able to deliver? Right now, I think 120 is sort of limit for CO2 on the higher end. So, and efficiency is probably four to five COP. So where do you see it in five or 10 years in future, the CO2 as a technology? I mean, CO3 as a technology will will be continue in the commercial refrigeration, but when it comes to high temperatures, we have other nice fluids to, to work on. When we go on temperatures higher than 120 degrees C, you get the challenge with, can somebody who has this mobile phone near to a, to a microphone switch off? <laughs> this is a, a mobile phone trying to do something. <laughs> now it's better, thank you. We will see CO2 in some applications. We will see hydrocarbons in other applications. We will see ammonia in many applications. And when it comes to higher temperature, our next project will be steam production with surplus heat. That means we, we then go most likely with ammonia, water, or hydrocarbons in this temperature range. And then we talk about oil-free system because when we go up of these higher temperatures, it will be a challenge with the oil, it will decompose. And so then we go with oil-free systems, make it more simple, more reliable. So that, there is a lot of development. But you guys, we, we, we are here to help you. And we, we will showcase what is possible. And even if there is a plan on phasing out HFC with something, why Professor Meyer had a nice frog? You can leapfrog. You don't need to go all this detour. Why? Because, because if in some, some state, of course, nobody can supply a CO2 system, but maybe they can do a hydrocarbon or ammonia system or whatever. But it, if, if there is no push to go to the clean refrigeration, you will have always these detours because, and you will be surprised how many participants from that manufacturer, manufacturing uh, companies are in all these commissions. Yeah, and as nicely said this morning, <coughs> the natural working fluids have no lobby in these commissions. And despite of that, we are talking about it. That's a major advantage, I would say. So despite the lobby, it is coming. So uh, there must be something. So I think uh, just in the interest of time, so we 
Uh, we would like to know from Professor Arakiri, you know, he's been the editor-in-chief for Sadhana, which is a journal from the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, for the mechanical division. So is there a possibility to bring out a special issue on natural refrigerants that you foresee? You want it? Yeah. We, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, first, I just wanted to make some general remarks. Sure. Sir. And maybe uh, the industry people may not like it so much. Uh, I've been hearing of sustainability, uh, green energy, etc. But I think we just talk. We don't do anything about it. Right? Look at the number of bottles sitting here. Are they really necessary? Right? And similarly, in Bangalore, the climate is so good. Why do we need air conditioning? Can't the government come up with a policy where a certain climate condition is there? You don't need AC there. I've been to hotels where the you know, temperature is 20 degrees. And the outside temperature is perfectly 25. I can't change the temperature. I can't open the window. Right? So this, this is where the government can intervene and set up standards which are specific to India. So that was just a general remark and uh, for example in mechanical engineering we built an auditorium which is naturally lit, lit naturally ventilated with new type of uh, acoustic paneling and we had a great difficult time talking to the special I mean the supposed specialists you know to give us new solutions but luckily there were a few who said you can try this out and it is working perfectly well so for example Bangalore you don't need any of this I don't, I don't mean to kill the air conditioning industry in Bangalore, but I'm just saying. <laughs> so, I, so there was a question on whether you need disruptive uh, um, in academic environment. I think the students should start learning disruptive thinking first, what is absolutely needed, and only go for that. Right? So then only you'll get sustainable solutions in reality. So, <clears throat> yeah, these were some of the general remarks I wanted to make. And uh, specifically to Sadhana, I would uh, really welcome one or two review articles where uh, there are mention of uh, what the history of natural refrigerants is and how, what is the future for that. And I believe that will be very useful to the readers of Sadhana and uh, especially for India specific solutions. So I have nothing against MNCs, but uh, you see, once you have technologies which are borrowed, which are developed in some other country for that region, for that climate, but we need India-specific solutions where you develop new technologies which can be exported. Okay, thank you. No, so, uh, please. Along with Ishwe in Chennai, we have done a trial. This is set at 27. All the air conditioner, we recommend that, you know, the, for human comfort, that is totally sufficient. Some people, you know, we set at 20 degree, 22 degree. We, we have launched a drive set at 27. Yes, yeah, Actually, it, is, it was very much, uh, very well received by all the people. Many hotels, many restaurants, you know, everywhere after the dive, we have seen that, you know, people setting at 27. The minister who participated in that event, after that, you know, uh, our team went for some discussion with him. We saw his uh, AC also was set at 27 degrees. <laughs> you know, it was a very good drive. Maybe, you know, uh, along with your point, you know, we wanted to make this point also. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All India uh, initiative. Correct, correct, correct. Everywhere, you know, wherever possible, we should do that. Two degree, three degree difference can make a lot of difference in energy saving. Yeah. First of all, you right. need ACs is the first question. And if you do need, then you put it at the right temperature. Right. Yeah, Thank I you. think we have somebody. So, uh, since I was party to uh, BE's, uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency uh, discussion on this, in, uh, there was a discussion with air conditioning manufacturers. Uh, and uh, in fact, this point was uh, discussed in depth. and. Uh, uh, it was also suggested to be, uh, and uh, AC manufacturers also, that uh, the ACs be set at 25, minimum 25 degree. This has already been communicated to them. Okay, thank you. So I think, <laughs> Dr. Christoph, you had something to add? Yeah, that was just one 
comment uh, trying to answer your question, sir, about the heat pumps uh, future or yeah, future or possible solutions or directions for development for the five uh, years to come. Uh, it's hard to say because uh, this is the right moment in Europe, at least, where uh, all those different research institutions, uh, together with industrial partners, are about to submit uh, their applications to the call that is uh, is to be published uh, very soon. So everyone is uh, holding their card pretty tight. But uh, to me, uh, the most uh, probable directions would be for sure hydrocarbons in different, many different configurations with ejectors, with uh, more sophisticated layouts, you name it. And for sure cascading, cascading between hydrocarbons, but also cascading between, as Armin mentioned, between hydrocarbons and steam. Steam becomes an obvious uh, option for really high temperature applications. Just to close the, the remark. So we had uh, three more people on the dais who have not spoken. So, so Professor Maya, you have anything to add? What I want to add is, see, first we have to see what are the low flying fruits. First is, uh, I want to build people to build system with no sophistication, CO2 system, which will give cooling, no ejector, no sophisticated uh, control walls, no control, on-off control only. Let it go full throttle. When it's on, it will give full throttle, hot water. So let us master in this. You have got umpteen number of applications. So it's only two, two portion control, on off. When you want hot water, you on. Then if you don't, off. So after this, we can try to make sophisticated system, improve the efficiency. E with this simple system, we'll be able to say, because it will get a COP of combined COP of five, six, you know, without any ejector, without anything. So why can't we try this first? And then we need to develop all in no skill, how to handle this, how to weld, how to maintain, how to switch on and switch off. All okay. these things are you have to develop. Then only we will grow. Sure. So, so, that's why critical mass is so that's uh, just in the interest of time. That's a very nice suggestion. So I would like to know what alpha level can offer in that. So whether do you will you support what Professor Maya says and what sort of things that can you? Yeah, means uh, what Professor Maya says from alpha level, as you all know that we are leaders in heat exchangers. So what we can help you uh, with the optimized heat exchanger, like Professor Pramod Kumar has explained, the CO2 is a notorious refrigerant. <laughs> uh, we have to take care of pinch points. Uh, but our heat exchangers are designed so that we can get, get a closest approach. And we can increase the evaporation temperature to get what required chill water temperature. Similarly, a higher uh, water outlet temperature up to 85 to 90 degrees centigrade uh, so that ultimate COP can be increased. So that's where we can come and help you, uh, even with the development of new heat exchanger also, if industry demands so. Okay, I think to counter that thing, what Professor Maya said, so you can model some things and simulate it in virtual reality and say that this is the automation that is needed now, so, yeah, that follows. Optimization is definitely something of interest to us. Uh, yes, on-off control definitely is the simplest. Uh, but probably might not be the most optimum, especially from the response point of view. So, you know, that's one part. The other is ultimately we're always looking at improving the efficiency, COP, etc. And, you know, if you want to look at, uh, you know, further generations, I think uh, mixtures, hydrocarbon mixtures, mixtures probably would be of interest, especially when you're looking at cascades, right? You want different temperature levels and you want to optimize. So that would be an interesting area to look at. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So before we close for the day today, you know, if there are any questions from the audience, it's fine. But otherwise, I would like some comments from the Navy before we uh, look their experience in, you know, Commander Anirup and Chetan, both of you, you have been leading this effort right from beginning. So you can just make a closing remark, probably. Yeah. Yeah, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Chetan. I'm basically from DRDO. Uh, I'm presently working with Indian Navy on the, their R&D projects. Uh, so one of the projects that we had taken up was on implementation of natural refrigerant for ship-based applications. Uh, so the main forte or the main idea of this project was to take out all HFC and CFC-based uh, 
refrigerants from the ship. Uh, this is mainly because of two reasons. One is to meet the IMO regulations for the future. And second, we had faced some incidents where we had explosions okay. with respect to certain refrigerants. So we had taken up this project. So the initial design phase was started with IIC and it was uh, like we faced a lot of difficulties with respect to the design, uh, especially with respect to the fabrication part of it and achieving certain COPs. And uh, Navy has a very stringent requirement with respect to shock standards. So the present plant whatever has been designed is meeting the shock standards as well as the IMO regulations. And presently the plant has completed more than 600 hours of operation. And uh, we have experienced where we are able to achieve COPs above four for considerable amount of time. So we are very confident that the present plant can be directly taken onto the ship. And uh, in the near future, it will be implemented on warships in India. Thank you. You have anything to add to that? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this uh, wonderful workshop. All this information which we required was uh, given on a platter here. So, uh, uh, other than that, uh, what we were looking uh, is, uh, again, a scaling up of this. Presently, we have developed a plant, like uh, Chetan has told, we have developed a plant which is of 30 TR of capacity. So, now uh, we would be uh, requiring, a, a, for a destroy class of ship, a minimum requirement is somewhere around 120 to 140 TR plant. So, that is what the scaling up of uh, this particular plant which we are looking at. So, considering this uh, environment, and uh, we know that this, uh, as per this Kigali agreement and all, India will be uh, forced to phase out all these HFC and uh, HCFC based refrigerants. Presently, we, the refrigerant which we use on board is R134 Alpha. 99% of uh, Indian naval warships are using R134 Alpha, which is an HCFC based, uh, HFC based uh, refrigerant. So, in, instead of going, uh, like uh, Professor Hoffman has told, uh, instead of going directly to HFO, we can directly move to natural refrigerant and uh, start uh, um, directly going to a green-based uh, uh, refrigerant. That is the aim of Indian Navy. So, probably uh, in another aspect to it is that uh, uh, we would be, uh, majority of our ships are having uh, AC plants uh, which needs a retrofitment instead of uh, directly going for uh, a new a new plant uh, we have to look forward with the present chill water system and condenser based seawater cooling system has to be retained this is a challenge which we will be facing uh, whether uh, if the same plant is being taken on board so we can't actually retrofit everything and anything on board a warship so with uh, doing a minimum minimum amount of retrofit and how we can go about the complete uh, replacement of the ac system that's what the challenge which we are looking for next and i hope uh, the present uh, technology i being iac as the partner to it and uh, industry all uh, triveni turbines uh, danfos all these industries are also there with us so we are confident that we'll be able to do that in future thank you very much sir yeah. thank you so I think uh, we have come to this concluding session of this, but if there is any feedback, you can write to us, or if, you, if there is a good feedback, you can relate here, bad ones, you can write to us. <laughs> okay, if not, then Maybe yes. All the presentations you can download later on, and if, if you need something else. Sure, develop. yeah. So we have just uh, so final comments from Professor. We started the discussion by throwing a stone on the harness nest. So the 30 year thing which I was mentioning, compared to the 30 years ago today, the country as such is in a much better condition. The technologies are much better. There is a much more impetus and then there is, you know, uh, there should be a feeling that we should go uh, better in terms of uh, environment, etc., which is going on in the country. So as far as India is concerned, it is, much more ready to go for natural refrigerants today compared to what it was 30 years ago. I didn't want to tell it right in the beginning because I wanted to create the thing. But now, the thing that has come up is through the DST is that, of course, uh, is the natural refrigerant a challenge, you know, like we had the global challenge for this thing. We can have one uh, so that a few, seven, six or seven, people can develop with the industry and the researcher and various two, three, these things put together can develop systems and then show. 
and then we will have to make the uh, working systems like Professor Maya was mentioning it. And that is the first thing. Second thing is, of course, very important, as was mentioned, regarding the standards is very important because we have standards for uh, carbon dioxide cylinders and this and that and carrying, etc. Carbon dioxide refrigeration standards have got to be uh, there. Otherwise, you have to sell it. It's difficult to sell. In fact, I was involved with the hydrogen, uh, this thing, and then BIS has written the uh, various standards uh, for the hydrogen handling, for the distribution, and as a fuel, etc., etc. Et so it is very important that we should have standards so that we go ahead with the uh, using of this one like any other uh, equipment or appliance. So all these things have got to be done. Otherwise, we are in a very good position. I don't think that we have to wait for another 30 years. Uh, certainly, I won't be there. But certainly, very soon, we should be able to uh, get more and more of these natural refrigerated systems uh, in the houses and the various places. And that's what I wanted. To sure. Do. Thank you. So with this, we'll just end the session. <laughs> Professor Mayer, I think there is a small memento to be given to the panelists. Please. It's your privilege. Uh, somebody can help. Only me, one, one. One each of you. No, not one. Okay. I mean, yeah, you can. Okay. Thank you. 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 One more to promote as well, no?